Hello, my name is John Paul Harper. Great. Where and when were you born? I was born in Andrews, South Carolina, in January the 4th, 1924. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, January the 3rd, 1924. So that makes you how old right now? 97. Do you feel like you're 97? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And, and if you could state for the record, sir, what branch of the service were you in during the war? The Army Air Force. And what was your specific unit? I was in the 8th Air Force, the 492nd Bomb Group, located in England. And what plane were you flying in? We were flying in the B-24 Liberator. And what was your specific job uh, in the B-24? I was a nose gunner. Perfect. So before we go any further, uh, I want to backtrack. You mentioned you were born in Andrews. Did you grow up there? Right. Talk to us about your growing up years. Well, of course, when I was born, we were in the Depression, the Great Depression. And I remember the food trucks that would come to town. I remember the people that lined up to get the basic food, such as flour, sugar, and that type of stuff. Uh, the Depression was a tough time because nobody had the cash money to do anything. But during the Depression, when the WPA and the, and the CCC started working, they started a road construction business through town. There were two roads through the town. One was east and west, and one was north and south. But the south road was all dirt, and they were going to pave it. My father was an engineer, and he was made the engineer of that project. So after that, the Depression really wasn't too hard for us because he had an income, and it really helped us have a better time during the Depression. I finished high school, and, and while I was in high school, uh, this was in, in December during the per when Pearl Harbor happened. When that day happened, my brother and I, that Sunday afternoon, we were riding around town. We had dates with these two girls, and we were riding around listening to the big band music on the radio when they interrupted it and announced the, Pearl Harbor, the bombing at Pearl Harbor. Uh, to end that story, the two girls we were with ended up being our wives. But I graduated from high school about five months later and w well, went to college at Presbyterian College in South Carolina. Then in 19, uh, I stayed in college until I was drafted out of college, which was in uh, April the 1st, 1943. Now you want me to continue? Yeah, you're doing great. Oh, okay. I was drafted into the, um, to the Army. The Army. I was assigned to the uh, Air Force. I was sent to Panama City, Florida for basic training and had the basic training there. I went through gunnery school in Colorado. I went to uh, and also schools in uh, Florida and finally was assigned to a B-24 uh, Liberator and we went to Pueblo, Colorado, where we did our phase training and flew through night and day training for our missions. And and late, let me be sure I got the right dates. Uh, we went, we went overseas. We left June the first, nineteen forty-three. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, nineteen forty-four, forty-three, forty-four. We left June the 1st, 1944, and we ended up at the 492nd Bomb Group and, and located in North Pickingham, England. And we were in the, the 492nd Bomb Group, and we flew the missions out of North Pickingham. Our first mission was to Bremen, uh, Germany. Our third mission was to a chemical factory called Lugswood Haven, Germany. On that mission, we lost an engine and had, had a hard time getting back home, but we did make it back to England. And on our fifth mission, we were bombing Kiel, Germany. Kiel was in the northern part of Germany on, on the Baltic Sea. And we bombed Kiel that, that morning. And when, just as after we dropped the bombs, we lost 
an engine, and one minute later we bought, lost another engine. Both of these engines were lost to anti-aircraft. As we, after we got off of the target, we took a direct hit in the waist, and the waist gunner was wounded. And then we had so much flak, and we hit, we was hit into, we had so much flak hitting us that the left engine, one of the, the le one of the left outboard engine, caught fire, and that's when we knew we would have to get out of that airplane. We got, we had three wounded aboard. We uh, we got the, we got those guys out. And then the rest of us, and all 10 of us, were lucky enough to get out of that airplane, and all 10 of us were captured by the Germans that afternoon. We were sent to interrogation uh, camp where the Germans interrogated all of the American flyers. After about five, uh, I guess, five days and five nights of interrogation, they sent us to a, a prison camp called Stalag Luft 4. It Stalag Luft 4 was one of the largest prison camps the Germans had. It held about 10,000 people. They kept us in barracks. Of, they had 10 rooms. Each room was about was a, about the size of a pretty fair live, uh, not living room. It would be a pretty sad uh, bedroom. 25 guys were in that room. They fed us, they would, this camp was located in what was now, what is now Poland, in the northeast part of what's now Poland. And in that, in that camp, it was so cold at that, that place, it was on the Baltic Sea, and it was not far from uh, the Russian border. And let me stop for a minute, if you will. Sure. I'm getting so confused, I'm missing a bunch of stuff. I think you're too worried about making it perfect. No, I, I'm just, I, I don't know why, it's just not, it's, it's just not a, for some reason, it's just not a. Do you know what that is? Is he trying, it sounds like, yeah. uh, huh? Yeah. I, I don't know, but I just can't seem to get it. Do you have pictures of what happened? Remember, that's what helps us. Do you want, I mean, it depends on whether you want to tell him the story as you tell it to the kids. I was thinking about doing that. Well, that's well, what you should do, because you missed it, like, when you had to wrap the guy up to put him out of the plane, and he landed it, in the field, and... And the, the thing about the no, well, how he was in the nose gun, and they thought he was the one that was... Yeah, yeah, you're missing a lot of stuff. Oh, well, I, I didn't think he wanted all that, because yeah, that... Does. Well, well, when I, I do that, I get in a, a bowl of, like, a speeching thing, and you would say, just try to talk naturally, and I, swear, I guess that... Yeah. Thinking what you may want to hear as opposed to telling you the real story. He you just need needs to tell, to tell you the story. Do oh, you okay. hear what he said? Yeah. You just need to tell uh, us the story. Don't worry about what I want. Oh, oh to okay. Hear because I can always make it look real nice. But uh, just pretend. So he goes to what? You were talking about school? He oh. talks to middle schools. He talks to groups. He talks to veterans. He so he talks to anybody that wants to hear that story. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I don't think, I don't think Dad's, I'm sitting here watching this. I don't That's think not, Dad's forgotten any of it. He's just skipping He's it. just trying to figure out what he can take out of it. Yep, that's basically. As opposed to he telling you the, the whole thing. story. He no, wants, no, he no, wants no, the whole we, story. I, I definitely want the whole story. Okay. Like how many missions you flew before okay. you were shot okay. down. And it was... And when you got back, you always uh, had a drink. Okay. About, uh -huh. all that about stuff. the missions, what it was like in the Kwanzaa Hut. Okay. It's not the light, is it? We can turn the lights down. Is that... No, 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 no. It's just, I would just, I guess I was just trying to, the light John was saying, I was trying to eliminate trying to some to of summarize it. summarize it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't need, you need the details. No, no. I, okay. I, the details are the most important part. Okay. <clears throat> All right. If if you want that, I can, if you don't mind doing it, I can start off and and well, get. And let me let me help you out here, Dad. Okay. He always. You know to how things. when you talk to different people, you. On April the first, nineteen forty-three, I was drafted into the army, <clears throat> assigned to the Air Force. I trained in Panama City, Florida, in basic training. 
I trained at Panama City, uh, uh, Florida, and gunnery training. Uh, and in Colorado, I was uh, went through armament school. And then we were assigned to to the uh, airplane or uh, uh, crew. The crew was designed, and we were sent to Pueblo, Colorado, for phase training. We flew day and night. And after training, we were then sent to England. We went on the Queen Elizabeth. It went without an escort because it, the, the Queen of uh, the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary were so fast that a German submarine couldn't keep up with it in order to sink it, so they didn't need an escort. We arrived in England, and we were assigned to the 492nd Bomb Group. This was part of the 8th Air Force. We were located at North Pickingham, uh, England. At our air base, we had a, a little over 100 airplanes. In fact, the 8th Air Force, they had some uh, 40 airfields, and of those 40 airfields, yeah, they were assigned roughly 100 airplanes. But at our air base, we had a little over 100, and we flew missions out of North Pickenham, basically into France and Germany. Our first mission, we went to Bremen, to Brem, uh, I can't remember now, Bremen. We went to Bremen, Germany. And the third mission, we went to Ludwig, I can't even pronounce it now, but then we went to a bomb our chemical plant in Germany. On that mission, we lost an engine. We had a hard time getting home, but we made it home. We made it back to England. On our fifth mission, this mission was to Kiel, Germany. And on, at Kiel, Germany, we would bomb the submarine pens and the ammunition depots. On that mission, when we, the Bomb run was a fairly easy bomb run, but when we got over the target, we dropped the bombs and then we took a direct hit from anti-aircraft into the right inboard engine, and that stopped running. In one minute, we took a hit in the left outboard engine, and it stopped running. Then the next time, next one, next one was the direct hit in the waist of the airplane, and the waist gun suffered a horrible leg wound. And as he went down, he cried out over the intercom. Because we were taking so many hits in the nose of the airplane, and I was the nose gunner on that airplane, the bombardier and the navigator, was sit there, their position was right behind the nose turret. They thought I was the one that was hit, and I was the one that cried out, so they opened the doors to the turret and dragged me out of the turret. When I got up off the floor, I said, I'm not hurt, I'm not hit. And the three of us were standing there, and before I could get back into the nose, we took another direct hit right in the nose that just destroyed the nose turret. The uh, bombardier suffered a horrible head wound. We bandaged that as best we could, and then the three of us decided that there was no need to stay in the nose of the airplane because it was so damaged, none of the equipment, the instruments, but over half of them wasn't even working. So we went to the flight deck. That's where the pilot, co-pilot, and, and engineer, and, and the radio operator worked. There was nothing I could do on the flight deck, so I decided I'd go to the back of the airplane and see if I could help the guy that was wounded back there. By the time I got to the back of the airplane, the tail gunner had been wounded. And while we were bandaging and taking care of the, the waist gunner who was in and out of consciousness, I noticed that the left, uh, left inboard engine was, on, was smoking, and I realized it was on fire. And I knew then that we would have to get out of that airplane. It was just a few minutes later, and the pilot rang the bailout bell. That meant get out of the airplane as fast as you can. The waist gunner was in and out of consciousness, so we knew he wouldn't be able to open his parachute because we, we wore, all of us wore a chest type parachute. You had a ring in it that you'd have to pull out. And uh, we, so we tied a rope around that, his ring and to tied the other rope at the top of the seat of the airplane. We opened up escape hatch, which was the camera door, and we pulled, put his parachute on him. We pulled him over there and we pushed him out and his chute opened. We got the other wounded guys out and then we started, go, we started jumping. 
Well, when my time came, I just got to the escape hatch. I just dropped on my knees and I looked down and for some reason it just popped in my mind, wow, it's a long ways down there. And I just rolled up. We had had very little instructions. Or we had never jumped before. We had very little instructions on how to jump. But when the, open, when the chute opened and everything settled down, it was just as quiet as it could be. And it just seemed like it was in a different world. The world had just stopped. But as I was coming down in that airplane, I noticed that I was going to land in this field. On the edge of the field was a road, and across the road was these two ponds and the woods. And I thought, well, if I could just get across that road, I could hide from these people. So when I landed, I got rid of my parachute, my way west, and all this heavy clothes that we had. Now, as I started running out of the field to cross that road, as soon as I hit the road, I heard somebody hollering. And I looked, and there was a German soldier, and he had a rifle pointed at me. He had a dog on a leash tied to his belt. The dog was snarling and trying to get to me. The, the German guard was hollering at me, so I started hollering back at him, and I was hollering, don't you shoot me, and don't you turn that dog loose, and in fact, I even used a few, few cuss words just to get his attention. But he didn't understand one word I was saying. I didn't understand a word he was saying, and I realized then that I didn't have a weapon, I didn't, but he had a gun and he had a dog. It was time to give up. I surrendered then. He marched me into a little town called Leek, Germany. And they put us in, it was a jail, a small place they put in. The jail was, the, was in the basement, which it looked like a dungeon to me. But when they put me in there, the pilot and the, waist, the tail gunner were in there. So the three of us spent the night there. The next morning, they took us out to what they called an interrogation center. And they would take us there. When we got there, they put us in individual padded cells. In my cell, there was one iron cot, one bucket, and one light. The light bulb was controlled from the outside, the guard, but they kept my cell dark the whole time I was there. So I didn't know the difference in night or day. Shortly, they came and took me up for the first time and took me to a, a interrogation. It was a small room. A German officer was sitting behind it, the desk. I was standing in front of his desk. There was a little stool behind me, and the German guard was behind the stool. And the first thing they told me was, take your clothes off. So I started taking my clothes off. I just naturally sat down to take my shoes off. And when I sat down, the guard hit me in the back of the head and knocked me on the floor. And he says, I did not tell you to sit down. And while I was on that floor, I was thinking, boy, you better pay attention to what they tell you and what they're doing or you will get hurt. Now as a prisoner of war, you don't have to, you're only supposed to give them your name, your rank, and serial number. And that was what I would answer every question. Well, the guard would get furious and he'd hit you in the top of the head, on the side of the head, on the shoulders, and say, answer the question, answer the question. The officer sometimes would get so mad, he'd pick up his German Luger pistol and he'd stick it in your throat and he'd threaten to shoot you if you didn't answer the question, but I never did. They'd take, finally they'd take you back to your cell and then it might be 15 minutes later, it might be an hour, or two hours, or eight hours later, they'd take you, they did this round the clock, they'd take you to another interrogator. And so I don't, and they did this night and day. I, I don't remember how many interviews I went through, or interrogations, I guess you'd call it. But I figured out I was there for at least five days and five nights and at the end of that time, they took us, took about 150 of us out of the, the Dulag, took us to the railroad station and locked us in our boxcar. It was a 40 and 8 boxcar. It was designed in the First World War, designed for 40 men and 8 horses. We were stacked in there just like pigs. It was so many of us in it. Three days later, oh, while we were there in that gun, the American Air Force came over bombing that city. Thank goodness the, the guards all left us locked in the boxcar and we just stayed right in the boxcar. But thank goodness they didn't hit us or hit, this, hit the marshaling yards where we were parked. Three days later we ended up in a town that was in Poland, north, what is now Poland, northeast part of Poland, not far from the Baltic Sea and not, uh, not too far from, from the Russian border. They took us out of the, the rail car, 
walked us about a mile and a half, two miles up a dirt road to this camp called Stalag Luft 4. This was a German prison camp. It held some 10,000 people. It was had three lagers or compounds, we would call them. And in that, lo in that compound, there were 10 barracks or 10 buildings. Each building had 10 rooms and each room held 25 men. Most of the rooms had bunk, bunk, three, three tab bunk, bunk beds. In our room, we didn't have beds. We slept on the floor. And when we would, the 25 of us would, would get that, would lay down at night on a pad, there'd be just a little walkway, but at the end of our feet, that was the size of the room. Now, at Starlog Luft 4, it was so far north, even in August, uh, it was hot. Now, we were shot, I missed one thing, we were shot down August the 4th, 1944. It was hot, it was cold in, in, at Starlog Luft 4, even in August. They would lock us up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and unlock us about 8 eight o'clock in the morning. When they'd lock you up at night, they'd barricade the windows and the doors and they would turn dogs loose in the compound so that you couldn't come out of, your, out of the barracks. They fed us twice a day. In the morning, we had a, well, by the way, go back to the room. Our room had a real small stove, had one table, two bunk beds, one light bulb, and one wash basin, and one, one gallon bucket. So the, when you would feed, one of the guys from the room would take that gallon bucket, he'd go to the gate, and they would send him back with breakfast. Breakfast would be a watery-type leafy soup. All of the guys would put all of their cups or bowls on a table, and one guy would divide that gallon of soup by in those 25 cups or bowls. It would amount to not quite a full cup of soup for breakfast. They would feed us again that afternoon about 3 o'clock or 3.30. It was boiled potatoes. It was the real small potatoes, the ones they grew for livestock. They'd boil them and you'd get the same time. You'd get a gallon, nearly a gallon bucket of it. It amounted to just about two-thirds of a cup of, uh, of, in, in, of food or potatoes. About once a week, they would give us a bread ration. The bread was horrible. It, people said it, it thought the sawdust was put in the bread. It may have been. It sure did taste that bad. But at least they gave us that. Now, the Red Cross <clears throat> had a, a food package. The idea of this food package was one box of food would be enough food to survive on for one week. The sad part about it, I never got a full box. In that, in that, in that, but in that box, they had you know stuff like all oh, canned stuff, anything just it wouldn't be perishable, and they'd have powdered milk and this and sugar and and they had, they'd always have put a carton of, or not a carton a pack a couple of cup, packs of cigarettes in it. The bad part about it, we got very few of those pads, but without that Red Cross parcels, we wouldn't have survived that prison camp. Now at that prison camp, it was a very it was. It was very cold during the winter time. The guards were not good. The guards were, were in fact, one, his name was Fetal Elbow Smith. He was a huge man and had, he had big hands. He was just a vicious, cruel man. He took great delight in beating on the prisoners. Now, a guard could beat on you, could do anything to you, he could, they, and, and they would not be held accountable. Now. This one guard that I was telling you about, the big one, we always thought he was the hatchet man for the commandant of that camp because he seemed to get away with everything. We called him Big Stoop, and any prisoner that went through Starlog Luft 4 knows Big Stoop. Now, the winter was, like I say, was brutal and very hard, and you just didn't, you didn't have the energy to do a lot of stuff. We had a few little things, to say, like a softball or something we could throw around, but you didn't feel like doing much because you were just tired and you were hungry. And you, had, you didn't really want to do a whole lot. We were in that camp, and on, I guess it was February, um, February the 6th in 1944. That was we, we, uh, in 1945. We got there in, in August the 4th, and in February the 6th and 45, 
the Russian army was getting very close to this camp. The Germans didn't want to surrender us to the Russians. They wanted to keep us as a bargaining chip with them from America. So they decided they would evacuate the camp. They took the wounded and the sick out by rail or trucks. And the rest of us, they would go walk us out. And it was at least, it was at least 6,000 or more of us that would be walking. They divided us into groups of about 250 to 300 people into St. God's with us. So that morning we took our one blanket, we put our water, our food, and what other little utensils we had, we rolled it up and made a knapsack and put it around our neck, and that was what we were going to march on. Our group started, and it would send a group out about every 10 minutes, and uh, you wouldn't all go the same direction, you just go in a different direction. But that first day we were marching, one of the guards told us that we will only be marching for three days. We will go into another prison camp. Those three days turned in to be 89, 87 days of marching. Now, after the first night, we all knew that we would have to form a combine. A combine was nothing more than three men agreeing that they would sleep together. This way you would have three blankets for warmth rather than one. We would share all of our water, we would share all of our food, and we would march together in case one got hurt, the other two could help. All right, now on this march, we would sleep in, in, in the fields, we would sleep in the woods, we would sleep in barns, we would sleep in bombed up factories, wherever we could find, wherever we were at night, that's where they would bed us down. And they would bed us down just like you bed down the cattle, you get just as close together as you can so that they could guard you in the night. You had to sleep just right jammed up against each other. One of the horrible parts about that is, is that if you had to relieve yourself at night, you'd have to do it right where you were sleeping. They wouldn't let you go anywhere or do anything. And the same thing would happen during the daytime when you were marching, you just have to relieve yourself in the road or wherever you happen to be. After about, I guess a week, Everybody ran out of water and everybody ran out of food. The Germans would give us very little food on this march and very little water. We drank water out of rivers, streams, ditches, and, some, and sometimes even ditches. And some of that was really polluted water. We had to scrounge around as best we could to find anything that we could eat, and we would eat anything that we could find. Now, after about Another two weeks, everybody had dysentery from reading polluted water. We had lice, we had body sores, uh, we had blisters, and most of us had colds by that time. The Red Cross did their best to, bring f to leave food packages along the way so far, as, but they didn't know where we were because we were just walking in all different directions. And but they did get some, and without what little bit of food that they left on for us, we would not have survived that march. Now, as that march continued, it got harder and harder and harder. And, uh, and as it went longer, we got you could, fatigue and starvation started setting in. It got so bad that people, some of the guys actually started eating grass. Now, I always said, we, our palm by never ate grass, but we did ball grass, we ball roots and stuff, and we would drink the water, hoping that we'd get some little nutrients from that. Now, I have a map of this Mount March, and the map shows basically a straight line, but it wasn't a straight line. We zigzagged, we, they, did not, they did not take us on the autobahns or the major highways. We run, we put us on the back roads, and we just meandered all over the place. Uh, and many days we would backtrack. I can remember on March the first, it was most, it was so bitter and so cold, and it was still snowing. It was icy, and some of the ice was melting. It was mud on the road. I remember March the first was one of the hardest days. March the second, we turned around and went right back where we came from. Then the next day, on the third, we turned around and went back. So we walked over the same road three times. We we backtracked many times during the war, so during the march, so we never knew where we were. But as that march continued, we were going from 
we were going to the west, and when we got to a town called Ulsen, Germany, we ran into the British Army. Now, we had crossed all the way across Poland, all the way across, nearly all the way across Germany. And when we got to Ulsen, they didn't want to surrender us to the British, so they turned us to the south, uh, southeast, and we started in that direction. That was toward Berlin. Well, they weren't going to take us into the city, so we bypassed Berlin, and we were headed down toward the country of Czechoslovakia. We ran into the Russians again. They then turned us back to the west, and we kept going west until we went, got to a town called Bitterfeld, Germany. And this was where we ran into General Patton's 101st Timberwolf Division, and they liberated us from the German soldiers. And that was on February the 26th, 1944. I'm, I'm sorry, 19, yeah, 1945. I, I tell the story that that afternoon I was standing on the side of the road where the German guards had given up and had left. And we were headed toward the front lines of German, uh, General Patton's army. And I was standing on the side of the road that afternoon and I was thinking about what we had just come through. And on this march, we had been walking for nearly three months. We had... Uh, walked for nearly, nearly well, well over 500 miles. Some people said it was over 600 miles. We lost a third of our body weight. We were sick. We were hungry, but we were free. And we hadn't had a bath in three months. Some of us hadn't had a bath in three months, so we were filthy. But I just tell you, it was one of the greatest feelings to be free that day. It is hard to really express it. That night, the frontline troops did not eat their dinner so we could have some food. And, of course, it was more of us than it was of them, but we had food, and it was really good. Well, after we had eaten our dinner, the medics came by and said, you've got to throw it up. You can't keep that rich food on your stomach or you'll be really sick in the morning. So we threw it. All, everybody, all of us did what they told us to do. The next day, they flew us out of Germany, the, I mean, the American Air Force flew us out of Germany to Camp Lucky Strike. It was a, a multi-purpose camp located not far from Paris. We got there, they had this huge tent that was a, was a bathhouse and a big bonfire. When we got there, we just stripped off all of these filthy clothes. We put everything we had and put it in the bonfire. We took a shower and they gave us a haircut, a shave and new clothes and gave us some food. The very next day, General Eisenhower flew into Camp Lucky Strike to welcome us home. When he got there, he got out of his airplane, he crawled up on a platform that was there, and everybody started clapping, and he picked up a megaphone, and he said, stop that damn clapping. I'm not a movie star. My name is Ike, and I'm a soldier just like you. Later that afternoon, I had the good fortune of actually meeting General Eisenhower. We shook hands and we chatted. He talked to me just like we were old Army buddies. He was quite a guy. The next day, they put us in what they call a field hospital. It was not just a tent, but, and, we, and we stayed on cots. And they fed us four times a day and all the snacks we could eat during the day. Now, the food was all ball stuff, mostly chicken. and. Uh, and they gave us a lot of eggnog without the whiskey. And they wanted to fatten us up. We were there about 30 days, and we, do, we did gain some weight while there. But then the war was over. Uh, Germany, uh, Germany surrendered while we were in that uh, so-called field hospital. They then sent us back to the States, and we came into Norfolk. And, uh, and when we got to Norfolk, they gave us a furlough to go home and visit our families. And, and, uh, while I was at, at home, while, while I was at, at home, they gave us a second furlough to lengthen this furlough for another two weeks. I stayed there, and I knew that when, they, when I was going back to the service that I'd be sent to the Pacific to train for the invasion of Japan. But while I was at home, Je uh, President Truman ordered them to drop the two bombs, and they dropped the two atomic bombs. The Japanese surrendered. World War II was over, and the killing stopped. 
and there were over 400,000 American soldiers killed in that war, so we should never forget them. And that basically is that part of my story. Yeah, now I need to stop a minute. Sure, you did great. Thank you. The only thing I should mention, just for your information, because I, I know I, I've listened to a couple of your other interviews. The Timberwolf Division, uh, it's the 104th, 104, because the 101st is the Airborne. Oh. And the one, I think it was the 104th or the 101st. Exactly, it's the 104. Was the, the one that liberated you. Yeah, that 104. Yeah. 104. Okay, sometime I get the... I get the no, no, it's an easy mistake. Yeah. I mean, the, you got the Timberwolf, which yeah. is the part that matters. Well, I forgot to describe the, the B-24 and what kind of airplane it was. I meant to do that, and I forgot it, and I forgot the briefing, but anyway. Don't worry, we're going we're gonna to cover this all. Uh, okay. So if it's okay with you... I want to backtrack, and I want to cover some of the things you talked about in a little more detail. Okay. Right? So I'll have some questions. Okay. Um, if you could first tell us the story of how you actually heard about the the atomic bombs being dropped, how you and your wife were on the swing. Yeah, and we yeah, we went we were, we were sitting in the swings but at home at our home we had a grape arbor and under the great under under the grape arbor was this swing and we were out that that day uh, just sitting out the swing because I was on furlough and when we were listening to the radio and uh, we they announced it and that's when, that's how we I heard it on the radio. Can you talk about the that first reunion with your family? After you were a prisoner of war, what was that first reunion like? Well, it was a because we were all so happy, <laughs> and it was so just we were just it was just so great. Now, I was married. Now we got my wife and myself. We were married before I left. Now, I let I left. I got that. I left that up. But we were married before we left, and so it was great to get home to her and to the family and and I, I was the first, one of the first soldiers in the town to return. And so when I got home that night, it was late in the afternoon, and then that night they, I, they wanted me to tell the story. And so I did, and when they did, my sister was just, she wrote it down. And so I go back for, and look at that because I figured that's probably the most correct story I've ever told because I didn't tell it again for many, many, many years. But uh, that first night, they wanted to know everything, and I told them, you know, what I could tell them, and uh, and that was just a rejoicing, wonderful time to be home. How much did you weigh before the war, and how much did you weigh after you were first uh, liberated? Well, I weighed about a hundred, little maybe a little over 150 pounds. I would say about a, maybe 155 at the most. And when we were liberated, we laid it well, best we could tell we weighed, weighed about a hundred pounds, because. Most of the people would lose about a third of the weight. The average, during the Second World War, the average soldier weighed 147 pounds, and he was a little less than six feet tall. That was the average of all the soldiers. So we, we, were, we weren't big people. Um, so thank you for taking us through your story. Like I said, I just want to backtrack. Okay. And, and ask some specific questions, but it's important. Uh, the questions I'm asking you just got to pretend you're telling the story for the first time. I don't know anything about it, okay? Okay, okay. So, can you talk about when you first arrived in England, how did you get introduced to the 492nd? How did they, you know, welcome this new crew from the States? That, well, it was just like any, any army group, as you get replacements, get people in, they just, they come in, and you're green, but they don't pay any, you know, you, they just, you, you become part of that outfit and you start doing the same things they do right then. Did any of the older veterans who had already flown missions come and tell your crew about, you know, what you can expect, advice? No, I think that they trained us pretty well. I think we knew what we were going to do. And training, let me just go back and explain a little bit about the training, but when we got there, that we were just accepted, and they were they were glad to have anybody they could find to come in, you know. So they really they that was a good thing for them. They liked it, and we were trained and trained and trained. The army trained us, particularly the Air Force people, and I'm sure they do everything else to do all the other people. They trained you over and over and over so that you could do your job without really thinking about it. 
an example. We used the 150 caliber machine guns. When at armament school, we had to learn how, to, what all, how it worked. We had to take this gun apart. You had to take it apart with just whatever, whatever you happen to have on you. You could strip what they call field stripping it. You have to take it apart and put it back together. Yeah, take it apart. We did that so you could just do it without even thinking. Then they, what they did is they'd make you put a gloves on and you'd have to take it apart and put it back together with gloves. And I asked the question, why do you have to do this? They said, because you'll be in that airplane and it'll be so cold, it'll be minus 30, minus 40 degrees that you can't touch metal with your hand. You have to have a glove on. So you have to learn to do it with that. Well, we did that till we really became proficient in that. Then they put a, a mask on us. And I said, why are you doing this? Why do we have to do it with gloves and a mask? He said, you'll be flying at night. And if the gun stops firing at night, you have to take it apart and fix it. And so we learned, and so we did over and over and over again. As shooting the guns, we, we started shooting a pistol and we kept, we shot every kind of gun you could think of. We shot rifles and carbines and uh, bazookas and, and tom, some submachine guns, 130, uh, the 30 caliber and the 50 caliber machine gun. And uh, so we, we shot everything and you had to qualify. You just learned, you just do it over and over and over. And so you did it so you could do it and then under pressure, when you, when you come under a, a fighter attacks and or the German fight, fighter planes are attacking you or when the anti-aircraft is all over the sky, you have to do your job under that, that terrible pressure. And the reason you do it is you train over and over. And usually you're so busy, you're really not scared. But every, I, I tell people, when you get in combat, your heart starts racing, you really get excited, and I say you get scared, but you, you're so busy doing things, you don't have time to sit there and really worry about being scared, you just know you are. In fact, I use the expression that an old sergeant in the Marine Corps that fought in the Pacific and landed on many islands, and he used this expression. He says, when you're scared to death, you do what you train to do. And I think that's the best example of fighting in a war. When you come under fire, that's what you do. Thank you for sharing that. Can you take us through uh, the B-24 and the different crew members? Okay. You know, what their positions were? Okay. The, uh, the B-24, it required 10 men to fly that B-24 on what we call the flight deck. This is where the pilot and co-pilot flew. The engineer was there and the radio operator was there. There were, then in the nose of the airplane, there was the nose gunner that sat right in the bubble in the very point of the nose. Right behind the nose turret was where the navigator and the bombardier worked. Then when you go back to the waist, to the, uh, there was a top gunner. The top gunner was also the engineer. And the, and the waist, there were uh, two, two windows. There was a waist gunner, a, t a bottom gunner, which was a ball, we call it the ball turret, but it's a bottom gunner and a tail gunner. So there were five gunners, the nose, the tail, the bottom, the top, and the side gunner. All shooting, all had two 50 caliber machine guns. Now the B-24 could, would, was at that time was the biggest in airplane that uh, America had. It could go faster, it could go further, it could take more bomb loads. And, uh, but it was about, about the same as the B-17, only it was faster and bigger. Now the B-17 was called the Flying Fortress because it had so much armament on it. The B-24, in order to be it faster and do more stuff, they had very little or no armament on it at all. And that was the difference in it. Now, on a B-20, uh, on our airplane, in fact, at that time, there was no heat on the airplane. So you had to wear these lining, these leather clothes with fur lining in them, jackets, pants, suits, gloves, and, and helmet. In fact, I wore three pair of gloves. I wore a silk pair, a wool pair, and a, and a leather pair. We also, this airplane was not pressurized, so above 10,000 feet, you had to wear a rubber oxygen mask. And in addition to that, your helmet was fur-lined, 
and then you had goggles because when you got at altitude above the 20,000 feet, it was so cold, like minus 30 degrees and colder, that you just didn't want any part of your body exposed because an average mission would take us eight hours. So it was just a long time in the cold weather, and it made it, that made it very, you know, very uncomfortable, in particular with all of that heavy clothes that you had to wear. But that was the B-24. And, and tell us, what kind of bomb loads would the oh, plane carry? We could carry, t but we could carry 10,000 pounds, basically. Now, it also, when you go on a bombing mission, it depends on how far. The further you go, the less bombs you can take, because you ha the first thing you have to put on an airplane is the amount of gasoline it takes to go and come back. All right, that's the key to it. If it's a long ways, you'd make less bombs. But it would normally be 10,000 pounds of bombs, and you could take 10 1,000 pounders, you could take 2,500 pounds, and any kind of combination up to 10,000 pounds in the bombs in a B-24. And we could fly it up to 30,000 feet. Um, talk uh, more about your position in the, in the nose turret. I mean, do you have any armor in front of you, or is it just the, the, the windows? Okay. Right. It, the, the nose turret is basically is just a plastic bulb. You have two 50 caliber machine guns. They are mounted just about head high. And when you sit in, you're sitting in a seat, and your controls are in the middle of your, middle of your legs. And you can, that turret can go straight up, straight down, all the way to the right and all the way to the left. And when you turn the turret, of course, you, your, your guns go with you. Uh, you could see from the tur from that turret, you could see that was, you could see everything there because you're sitting right in the very front of the airplane. I, like I tell people, it seemed like you could see the world, and I tell people, hey, I saw things I really didn't want to see up there. But the rest of the people, they were in different type of, connection, but the nose gun was really sitting into it where he could see everything. When you say you saw things that you really didn't want to see, what do you mean? But like when American bombers going down and see German fighters and and anti aircraft, you didn't want to see any aircraft. And I tell people that I just describe the anti aircraft is they see movies and you see these airplanes flying and there's little black puffs of clouds all over the sky. That's the anti aircraft. The anti aircraft is nothing more than a shell that comes up and explodes like a hand grenade, and shrapnel goes in every direction. And anti-aircraft, that's what, that's what it is, it's just shrapnel, and that's what tears up an airplane. But when you see those things, when you were close enough, if there were black clouds, it really didn't bother you. But if you could see a little orange middle of it, then you were in trouble because you were close enough that you would be hit by that anti-aircraft. And it would just pop holes all over the airplane when it would hit you. And now, uh, in the B-24, we had no armor plate. I had one little bulletproof piece of glass. It was maybe about a, a 10 inches wide and about 12 inches tall. It just sat right up in front of your face. It was in the turret and it would move with the turret. That was the only armor plate. And we did carry with us. We carried a type of a, a like a, a pot helmet that you could put over your, your, your normal wear. We also had what they call flak suits. They were nothing more than a, an apron for the front and an apron for the back that you could put on when you got close to any aircraft people or to the fighter people. And, and that's what the, that was the only, only thing, only protection that we had. Thank you for sharing that. I just have some general questions, sir, uh, about the missions before okay. we go over your actual mission. You were shot down in more detail. Okay. So just in general. Um, can you can you explain a little bit more about the how you guys would take off and get into formation? Oh, okay. Because my understanding is fog was a big issue. Uh, yeah. Okay. What what we would do? Let me start. They would if you would go fly a mission, they'd really wake you up around four o'clock in the morning, somewhere in that neighborhood. You go to breakfast, then you would go to briefing. Briefing was in a room that all, everybody who would fly that day from out of that bomb group would be in that room. And they would open up this curtain at the end of it. They had this huge map of Germany. And on that map, they would have these uh, 
tapes, little red tapes or green tapes, and it would it'd show you the route that you would go fly into the, the city you would go bomb and the route that you would come home. This was the way you were supposed to go in and this is the way you were supposed to come out. At that briefing, that's when they would tell you how many gallons of gas you'll have, how much the bomb load will be, what it was, and where you were going, and how many rounds of ammunition each area gunner would have. They would give you all of the details that you needed to fly that mission, the weather and everything. But you were supposed to take off and do all of these things. After that meeting, I'll say this to you, after they finished the briefing, not one person in that room would get out of his chair until the chaplain came in. When the chaplain came in and after his prayers, they would then take us to the airplane. And then it, when we got to the airplane, we'd put on all this gear, the heavy clothes and all of the stuff that we had to put on. We'd get in the airplane and then we would wait. If, normally, we, if we, the weather were permitted, we'd take off. If not, we'd just sit there and wait until the weather did cut. And in England, you did a lot of waiting on the runway, waiting for the weather to clear. But now as soon as the weather was cleared, you would take off. And you would take off and you'd fly and you'd be gaining altitude at a certain rate. And as you'd take off and you go a certain number of minutes, you would then turn and you'd turn. It's like going up steps. And every time you'd turn, making a sort of a rounded type football type thing. But each time you'd turn, you'd be going higher and higher and higher and higher. And that's when you go until you broke out into the clear. And when you get out into clear, all the tail gunners had is these uh, lights that they could shine, uh, like a spotlight. And each bomb group would have a green color or a blue color or something, and they would be flashing it. And that way, when you come out and you could see it, you would know then which, which airplanes you're supposed to go to. That's how you formed up, is by looking, after, looking at the tail gunners' blinking light. And uh, so, because you would not, you would, would it would be every every day, all every bomb group would be putting up some airplane. So when you get that many airplanes, oh, you got you had airplanes all over the sky. You could just see thousands of it every day that you would fly. But you you needed to fail weather, but it was it was rainy and cloudy a lot in England, and the weather really did hinder us from flying. I mean, were there times that the planes would still uh, take off even if it was overcast? Oh yeah, you would, we'd take off a lot. Most of the time it would be some overcast. It'd be clear enough on the ground that you could see to get off the ground. And then you'd do all the instruments until you just got right up to, till you broke out of the, over, the, over the top of it. But you have, to, you have to be able to get over the top of them in order to form up. Because you form into formation, you have to form, get a formation to, to fly a mission. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. Could you take us through your first mission in, in more detail? I mean, what was what, what what was going on in your head before your first combat mission? Well, we we knew pretty much what was going to happen, but we had never come under fire before. Now, now that really was what, no, no, nobody can tell you about that. It's. We had confidence. I think we all had confidence. We, you know, we knew. We said we could, we've done this thing. We've practiced. We've done it, and and we fit into the group. You know, with nothing, you you did your job, and so on. The first mission was to Bremen, and uh, and when we got close to the target, we didn't see any F. We didn't see any uh, German fighters that day. It was nothing but anti-aircraft, and before we got to the target, we started picking up. Some of the, and and that was a that was a rude awakening. I mean that was you, nobody can explain how that would happen to you. What kind of feeling you'd have when you come under that attack? But that was a different feeling. And what was the target in Bremen? I forget what it was. I think it was an airfield, but I'm not. I don't remember right now. Sure. But anyway, we had, you know you had a specific target, and that was what you were going to going to try to bomb. And you would fly and you'd drop the bombs. Sometimes you'd drop all the bombs, what they call salvo at one time. Sometimes you'd just drop them in a train, one, you know, one every second or so. It, but they would tell you how, what they wanted you to do before you would go. You knew exactly what you were going to do before you got in that airplane. But they, everything went well. Nobody could ex tell you how, what your reaction would be when you come under fire, when you come under any aircraft. As I always tell people, 
There were 10 boys that got on that airplane and 10 men got off that day. Because it, 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 I know this, when we got into at Bremen and all of that anti-aircraft was around us, I knew this. I said, this, you know, this is not a game. This is really something serious. These people are trying to kill us and we're trying to kill them. I said, this is, a, this is what war really is. And that, it was a rude awakening when you first get under fire, but from, you know then what it's all about. Thank you for sharing that. Do you, on any of the missions you went on, were there times that you saw fellow planes getting hit and going down? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah you would see that, not every mission, but you'd see a lot of it. I mean, from your perspective in the nose, I mean, what would you actually see? Well, you just, well, you just see, the, you just see a, an airplane that'd be flying in your formation, and you'd see one that you'd see smoke coming out, or you, you know, you'd see it start, you know, what it would drop out of the formation. But they'd drop up pretty fast because you were flying at about, say, 200 miles an hour. And if an airplane got hit and lost an engine, his speed drops down pretty quick. So it's just. Uh, just a minute or so, and he's you know you won't even see him because he's he's by, he's low and he's behind you, but you could see him. You could see the fire. You could see the smoke. You could see the airplane having trouble, and you'd see him. It's it was, it was very unusual because I'll give you one of the best examples. We had this uh, co-pilot that was in the 492nd, and he was one of the few crews that ever flew completed 25 missions with the 492nd. And he told me after the war that there were three airplanes flying right off of their wing that were shot down. In fact, we were, when the day we were flying, we were flying right off of his wing. And we were shot down. He says there were three of them. He says we never had, a, we never lost an engine in the 25 missions. And yet we had three airplanes shot down right beside us. And said we had, you know, lots of them shot down. But I mean, right? He said it was just. He said, what, what, why? You know, who knows? It, you had twenty, you had twenty-five or thirty thousand feet, and they're shooting anti-aircraft. You know, they can't pick up this airplane or that airplane. They're just shooting at all of them, and uh, it's just a matter of luck, I think, is whether you get hit or whether you don't. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, it's chance. We had, like I say, we had a. A hundred and I forget how exactly how many, a little over a hundred airplanes, but we lost a roughly half of our airplanes during the war while we were in the war. Could you tell me, sir, um, did you have any experiences against German fighters? Did you see any or take fire? From yeah, them? we saw, but we it was it, when we by the time we saw well, well, that's the way they did it. You saw a group of them, there'd be lots of them. When they would come, it be, wouldn't be one or two, there'd be a lot of them. And they would make a pass at you and then they would be gone, basically. But there were so many, gracious, there were just airplanes. Like I say, you could actually, when you would take off from England, you know, you could just look in any direction and you could see nothing but airplanes. It was just, uh, just hard, it was hard to describe that. But, you know, when you would go, to one airfield, like at Kiel, Germany, where we went there, I think there were 400 airplanes scheduled to bomb that city that day. You know, all it, they'd do it all day long. But on that mission, uh, we went, we had the briefing, and they told us what all we were looking for and everything. To, you know, what we what would expect. And on that mission that morning, we finished the briefing, and we did have a delay that morning uh, uh, because of weather. But we took off that morning for England, and an unusual thing. To get to Kiel, we didn't go directly to Kiel because you'd be flying over Germany so much as you'd be flying over the land. We flew over the North Sea. We flew up until we got to, to the Baltic Sea. Then we turned to the east and flew over the Baltic Sea. And then when we got to, we turned then south to bomb Kiel. Kiel was then on the Baltic Sea. The reason we flew over the water is because we wouldn't have to fly over anti-aircraft guns. And you wouldn't be shot at any aircraft, but if you were over land, you would be, you'd pick up any aircraft gun. So that's why we went in that direction. But then once we started from, we left the Baltic Sea, we were over land going into Kiel, and that's where they had the anti aircraft. You know, on that note, did you have any weird feelings that morning? 
Mm-hmm. About the mission, did anything did anything seem odd? No, uh, not a thing. The only thing that only thing that I had that I had any kind of feeling at all is just as we started to turn and we were started our turn is when we got we got lost the two engines. And once you lose two engines on a B twenty four, you in deep deep trouble. And because you're losing altitude, you're losing altitude, you're losing speed. But when we turned and and all these airplanes were going away from us, I just popped in my mind, boy, if I had me a rope and had tied, I could hold on and we could they'd pull us there somewhere. And I thought the dumbest thing you ever man ever thought about. But I, but you could just see them just going away and you knew that they were they were headed home and you weren't. But I just thought, hey, how could we hook on and go, but you couldn't do it. I mean, that was just a pipe dream. No, I, I think that's a very, really nice antidote. Um, if you could just take us through it again, I don't, you don't need to repeat it all, but the anti-aircraft shells that hit your plane. What was the order? Where did it hit your plane first? Okay, the first one we had is we got we got one hit when it was right over right over the top just as we dropped the bombs. Uh, and we started to turn. But once you drop the bombs you turn because you've been going f- straight and level and you want to get in another attitude attitude. As you turn, we got hit, a direct hit, uh, a an aircraft a shell right underneath the airplane and it hit the uh one of the right air, air uh, which, now which one it was, I think it was the left outboat engine. That was the first one. One minute later, we lost the one on the left side. We got a direct hit there. So we got two direct hits within one minute on the airplane from anti-aircraft. And this was right after we dropped the bombs. And then we got, a, and it was about a few minutes later, we got a direct hit in the waist. Where, that's where the waist gunner lost, you know, got his leg shot. And so on your fifth mission, as you guys were taking on the anti-aircraft fire. Yeah, that was anti-air. And once you get under, when you fly a mission, and once you get close enough or you get where it's anti-aircraft, you won't see the German fighters. See, they don't want to be, they'd be, in, they'd be under the same attack. So you don't see them. The only time you see them is when you're over, you know, you, you, there's no anti-aircraft. So on that fifth mission, when you were taking on the, that anti-aircraft fire, when it actually hit the plane, what did you feel? I mean, what does it feel like when your plane gets hit by the shell? Well, it just it just jars the airplane. It's just like you know, hit rough weather or something. You know, the airplane because it's losing speed, it's lost, it's, it's everything. So it's just like you know, it just like you be in a real tough, in rough weather in an airplane. And you mentioned three of the crew members were wounded. Right. So the. Can you take us through what were their injuries? Okay, the waist gunner was the first one, and he had a, a, self, a leg wound, right his the calf of his leg, terrible, but just it was a terrible wound. The uh, navigator got hit right above the eye and the top of his scalp, and uh, those were the two worst ones. Then the uh, tail gunner got hit, his was in his hand, and the, his wrist in his hand. He was anti-aircraft, some anti-aircraft happened to hit him. You mentioned earlier that you went to go help the waste gunner. Right. How did you help him, and what did you do? Well, well, he was in and out of consciousness, so there was actually see the well the uh, the waste the tail gunner was not hurt that bad, so he we, his hand was bandaged, and so he was helping the bottom gunner and myself, and the tail gunner. The three of us were helping the waste gunner that was injured. We were try we were putting the sulfur into the wound, and and we were trying to bandage it up with you know. With, what, everything we could manage it with, and trying to and get his parachute, we had to put his parachute on him, and then hook the line, you know, tie the rope to his stuff. We all do. That's what the three of us were doing. And you know, how long would you say from the first anti-aircraft shell hitting your plane to you guys bailing out? How long of a time period would that have been? No, uh, I, I I can't. I don't really know. It wasn't. It wasn't immediate. Put it that way. In fact. Uh, when we started home, and, uh, from and after we, because we were, when we got hit, we dropped out of the formation and we start we started losing altitude. We were continually losing altitude, and we were. Then we said, "Well, we will try to go home," and then we realized the pilot realized there was no way we would ever make it back to England. So then he said, "Well, why don't we try to go to uh, Sweden or some one of those countries over there?" So we tried to turn to do that, but when we did, the airplane went into, actually went into a left-hand turn, 
and it just sort of tilted to the left a little bit and just made a big, started a big circle and there no controls in it. And that was when he rang the bell up, bell, and that's when we got up. And the, 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 the history, I didn't see it. Once I jumped out, I never saw the airplane before, but some of the guys did. It just kept circling and losing altitude until they hit the ground. And uh, then there were so supposedly three young German people, one woman, I think two young men, two young boys, they were just children. And they saw the thing landed. And I've heard their reports about how it, it landed. It just, just went right into the ground. The, the waste gunner who was in and out um, of consciousness, I mean, was he lucid enough to be able to pull his own no, chute? No, no, no. We, we tied a rope around his the, the rip cord and tied the other end to the top of the, the roof of the airplane. And we pushed him up. It was just like a static line, just like you see the power troopers. They hooked the line up, and this is his chute open. And he he landed in, a, oh, I guess about a foot of a little lake, a real shallow type lake. And I always thought it was a good thing because, it, because he was unconscious, but he didn't, it didn't drown anything. And he stayed in the hospital the whole time. He was in for, for the, his whole time and it was being a prisoner. Wow. So he had a terrible leg wound. And just for the record, I mean, did all of the crew members survive the war? Uh, they all survived the war. At the end, but, but to my knowledge now, I don't know of any of them alive now. They could be, but it's, I've lost contact with a lot. Doing, after the war, the tail gun and myself, were, because we were really close friends, we were close. So we contacted each other, we talked to each other on the phone, we wrote to each other a lot. We did, we did a lot of correspondence with him. The uh, navigator, I met him, we met two or three times. He lived in Houston, Texas, and when I would visit up there, I would always go see him, and we enjoyed visiting with him. The pilot, it, we were not close, but after after many years, we started writing to each other. Then we started talking on the telephone, and we then we started communicating quite a bit before he died. But that was it. And then the, the, the ball tuck gun, gun uh, I contacted him uh, several, uh, more than several, quite a few times by telephone. And those were the, what, those were the only ones that I ever contacted after I got home. Sure. Uh, before we, we go over your POW experience in a little more detail, I, I did need to ask you, you being the, the nose turret gunner, were there times that you fired the machine guns? Do, do what now? On your five missions, were there ever times that you had to fire your, your nose turret? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Do you, can you take us through specifically what you remember? I, I, well, I, I, I can't remember particular, but I can tell you this about these guns. When you're flying, and we're going at about 200 miles an hour, a fighter plane, if he comes to attack you, he's flying about nearly 300 miles an hour. You're closing at 500 miles an hour, and that's quick. By the time he gets into range, it's the same thing for him now when he's coming. He's got, he's basically, he's using the same type of air, same type of gun, you know, not the same, but some, same type. So your range is about the same thing, but once you get into range, it's just a few seconds that you were able to even shoot at him or him shoot at you, you know, then. Uh, hang, hang tight one second. It's so, what's it? Oh. So just hang on one second, sir. Okay. Whenever a German fighter comes, you, like I say, you you flying at about 200 miles an hour, they're doing 300. You close it at 500. The range is so narrow, and it's just so few seconds that you are in range that you can shoot him down or he can shoot you down. So you don't have m much of a chance, and, and at that rate, you you and when you shoot the 50 caliber machine gun, you have to shoot it in short bursts because it spits out so many shells, if you hold the triggers down and just keep it down, it'll just burn the barrels up in no time. But, so you just shoot at short bursts and by that time, the, the plane is gone. Now one thing about when the airplanes attack you, let's say that he's up above us, he's coming in, he's coming down, he's coming right head on to us. And the nose, whenever he comes, you 
tell the tail gun, or you just talking over your intercom, you tell him whether he's coming underneath you or over the top of you, because that way he has a better chance of shooting him as he goes away if he knows where he's coming from. But he has to, be, has to know this because it's such a few seconds that he gets the chance to shoot him. But it's so fast when it comes. It's, uh, when you, and then the way the Germans did it, it'd be one airplane after another. And it would just be just a constant fly, one, 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 and they just kept right on going by you until they all whipped through. And then basically they'd be gone to some place, another place, another group of places. Because bomb groups were everywhere. And it'd be usually one bomb group following another one. Do you think most of the planes that were shot down from the 8th Air Force, and in your bomb group in particular, would it be from flak or from fighters? It would it be, be, I would say most of them would be flak, although there was a lot. We lost uh, 12 airplanes on one mission, basically from airplanes, from, from, but there were so many. That was, over, that was over the Baltic Sea. From fighters? From fighters. That was one of, that was one of the worst missions, it, but that was fighters. But, uh, Any aircraft could do the same thing. What eventually happened to the 492nd? The 492nd was the only bomb group in the Eighth Air Force that was ever disbanded. Right after, shortly after we were shot down, they they just, we I basically ran out of airplanes. They you know we lost so many. We lost over half of the airplanes, and uh, so it was just ran out of airplanes. So they just shut the they just shut the the 492nd down and the few pilots, the few crews that were left were sent to other bomb groups as replacements. But uh, we, the, we, didn't, uh, we didn't fly that long. Well, of course, n none flew, not many bomb groups flew for a long, long time. But at the time we were flying, you had to fly 25 missions. As the war progressed, they increased the missions to 35. And the reason for it, as the, when the war started coming to the end, there was fewer and fewer people shot down, so that, you know you could they could require you to fly more. Like in the Pacific, you would be required 50 missions in there before you could come home. That was perfect. But we had 25, and we only had basically one crew, and all of the 492nd to actually fly 25 missions while they were with the 492nd. And that was 130 some crews. Can you mention how you all could not be forced to fly? How you all? Oh, well, no, no. There's like the the Army or the Air Force had a, they, that was their requirement. You had to volunteer to fly, or you wouldn't fly. They couldn't force you to fly. It was the same thing with the submarine service. It was the same thing with the paratroopers. They wouldn't force you to be a paratrooper. And they wouldn't force you into a submarine. They would actually. Uh, or you'd have to volunteer. Now, one thing I always tell people, and it happened with the paratroopers, if you volunteered and you became a submariner or a paratrooper or an Air Force flyer, you did get extra pay. But, uh, but, but you could quit any time you wanted to. I guess the only place you couldn't quit would be on a submarine. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to get off. What, uh, you know, did you know anyone to refuse a mission? Never. No, I never knew the one for never uh, ever saw. It. That's that's one of the most amazing things, you know. Yeah. If they had the opportunity to, but they. Well, it was the same thing with, with whether you were in an airplane or whether you were to landed in a, a on Normandy or wherever, you were trained to do it. That was what you had. Was, so you knew that was what you were supposed to do, and you were trained to do it, and and you did it. You you just you knew somebody had to do it. Well, that's the reason I volunteered to fly. I, I looked when I was drafted into the service. I said, you know, I want to go and do where the fighting is. I said, somebody's got to do it. They said, you can't just stay here and do something else. And I had an opportunity that I could have stayed stateside, but I didn't. I wanted I wanted to be part of the action to where it was going on because I somebody had to do it, and I said I want to be part of it. Why? What was it? I, I don't know why. I can't tell. That was just the way that I think we all felt. And nearly all of us, not all, but most of the people, that's what most of them felt. That you know, I'll do what I have to do. Uh, I mean, that, that's such an amazing uh, way of thinking, you know, your generation. Well, of course, there's one thing we did know this now. We knew that, and I always tell people that 
There was a dictator and there was an emperor that wanted to conquer America and wanted to rule America. That would take our freedom away. We knew that if we didn't win that war, then we would not be a free country. And that was one of the biggest incentives, I guess, for us to say somebody's got to do it, so we'll go do it. Could you please uh, explain what was it like the night before a mission? I mean, what goes on in your head? Well, let me tell you about a mission. You go on a mission, and when you come back from a mission, you they, they send a truck out there for you, or, or, and they take you to uh, what they call interrogation. There's an officer that sits there. You, all the crews is at just one table. and. When you get to that table, there will always be a bottle of whiskey on that table so everybody could have a drink. That was just, they wanted to just sort of start relaxing because you would be uptight. Everybody that would turn would be, but I don't care what they say, they will be uptight on because they went through this uh, thing. But they would go in there inter in, in interrogation and the guy would ask questions about each, from each one of the crew members to tell what he thought and what he saw. But he gave you a bottle of whiskey so that you could have a drink. And as you left that briefing, you could, everybody could pick up their own, their own bottle of whiskey and take it home, take it to their barrack. You woke up, you got back, and you, it usually it would be late afternoon. And so you get back and you get uh, debriefed and you clean up and you go and you'd have dinner. And then basically you'd go to bed because you knew that you'd have to get up about four o'clock in the morning. You didn't have a lot of time when you were flying or scheduled to fly. And so you, you just went through eating and sleeping and that was it. And you, don't have a, you didn't have a lot of time in the afternoon. Now if you weren't scheduled to fly, then you did have time to visit and, and make friends, but most of the times you didn't. And the reason I think they gave you the whiskey is so that you could have a couple of drinks and it would relax you and you wouldn't lay in that bed and worry and, and, about what's gonna happen the next day. And I try not to ever think about what's going to happen. In fact, I don't. I just said I must have blocked that out of my mind. You can't think about what could happen. You know, you just wait and you just whatever happens happens. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the veterans who I've interviewed, the the Air Corps veterans, they talk about how that was one of the worst things is when they would spend too much time thinking about yeah, their yeah. next mission. Yeah. What, you know, whether or not they're going to get killed on that mission yeah. or. Yeah, I know. Uh, when I got home, and like I said, I was the first soldier, I think, that returned home. This lady came by the house to talk to me after a few days, and her son was a pilot in, in the 8th Air Force in England, and she was so excited. She'd heard so much about, you know, they're giving us a bottle of whiskey to drink and stuff, and she said, well, I don't want my son drinking. I said, lady, I said, don't you worry. It'd be good for him if he got drunk every night so he won't think about what he's got to do the next day. And but. You know, I don't remember people getting drunk, but that's just they gave you a couple of drinks and that would be enough to relax you. But anyway, they did feed us good. I'll say that. When they get up in the morning, we got eggs, real eggs. We didn't get uh, <laughs> fake eggs. We got real eggs and they did feed us good at night too. That was one thing. But we got two meals a day. I, I know you were at the base for, for those five missions only, but do you remember when you guys would go to the mess hall, and you would be eating, would it be noticeable that some of the other men would be missing, men who had been shot down on previous Not, not really, because by that time, you, know, you we really didn't, uh, we lived in Quincy huts, and there were two crews to a hut. Now if the crew in your hut was missing, that would, would that could bother you a little bit. But as long as all both of the crews ended up, you, you didn't, we didn't think too much about it. You know, once you got there, you just you put it behind you. You've done, you finished that mission, and you're thinking about something else. Got it. Um, before we get into the, the POW experiences, sir, when you were stationed in England, did you have a chance to go to London? No, we we, ne we went to the nearest city. Now, we, we talked about North Pickenham. It was just a location. The nearest city, that, a town that we had was Kings Lynn, and we could ride a bicycle. It was like maybe, I think, about three miles. And we would get a bicycle and ride the bicycle in and go to the pubs and uh, to sit there. But I never, they, they, they serve what they call bitters. 
And the only thing you had is a light or a dark bitter, and it would not, it would not, they didn't refrigerate their beer. That was just, it was just warm stuff, and it, it wasn't too good. <laughs> I mean, when you were in England, did you notice any of the, the damage done by the German rockets or bombs? I didn't see that much, really, because I didn't, I didn't go anywhere, basically, except at King's Lynn, and I go into town, and, and we didn't, we didn't even bother with going to the town. We just go into town and go to a pub where we could have a few drinks and have, a, you know, eat something that's different than army travel. And how, I, how did the locals treat you all? They were okay. They, uh, you know, they, they did because well, most of them are older people. You know, well, well females and older people because they were very most of the young people were close in the wall. So you didn't see many. You know, we just say the people that were basically working in the in the places. I, I've been to the UK to do some interviews, and, and they have a saying, you know, they, they call all the Americans who came over, you know, in the war, they call it the friendly invasion, <laughs> but they also say all the Americans were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, they say that. <laughs> you can imagine, all the British are off yeah. fighting, and then all these Americans, yeah. same thing happened in Australia yeah. and New Zealand. But, uh, Going back to that fifth mission, sir, so you bail out, had you had any previous training using the parachute? No, well, no, nothing but a lecture in the classroom. We had never it jumped, we never had any experience at all of doing it. Everything, only instruction we had was classroom instruction. And would you have a rough idea how high up you were when you jumped? I, I, but I, because I don't have a clue, but I, but I would always I thought we probably were about ten thousand feet. I can tell you this about it: it, it, it when we jumped, it, I would say my estimate was about ten thousand feet. But I'll tell you this unusual thing: when I was coming down, I must have been coming head first because I could see the ground, and I could see these fleecy clouds, and. Uh, and I thought to myself, when I get through those clouds, I'll be low enough to open the chute. Well, the thoughts were there that when they tell you you jump out of an airplane, don't open your chute right away. Wait till you get closer to the ground because if you open it up high, the Germans will have a better chance to see you and be able to capture you when you land. Well, I was trying to wait to open my chute, when, but I saw these fleecy clouds, and the next thing I realized, the clouds were gone. And I thought, Lord, I'm through that cloud. Why well, I opened that, I pulled that rip cord. I don't know what I did with it, but I know I just threw it away. But I just ranked that thing open because I said, I'm dropping, so I'll hit, it. I'll hit the ground before I get it open. But when it opened up, I still must have been about four or 5,000 feet in there. I was, I, you don't know, but I was up pretty high. Sure. And uh, I'll say one thing, the pilot, he said that he saw the same fleecy clouds and he did the same thing I did. He said, as soon as they realized they were gone, he opened his shoes. <laughs> Back, you know, during training, did they give you any escape and evasion tactics that you were all supposed to use? No, the only thing they told us to do is that each each soldier was given a each in the air in the air force. Each soldier was given a forty five pistol, and the only thing they told us to do is don't take it with you, because if you have a pistol strapped on you, and the Germans see it through the binoculars, they'll shoot you before you get to the ground. And if they don't see a pistol, you got a better chance of surviving. So we didn't even, I didn't even take, I think on the first mission we took the pistols and after that I think we left them in the barrack. I don't think we ever took another pistol with us. That's interesting. Um, but they never gave you, you know, a, a direction to always go? I guess by that, by no, that? No, no, they, they, we didn't have any uh, escape type of training or anything. They, they didn't go through that at all. What about the map? Did you have the, the No, nope, we didn't have any map? we didn't have any map. We had nothing. We just didn't well, to be truthful, we didn't think we would ever jump out every the ten of us when we were training, we said we're gonna never jump out this airplane. We're gonna ride it ride it to the ground. But when that airplane we lost two engines and when that third one started burning, we we, we were no doubt that we were going. You didn't you just said it was t we got to get out. I knew the minute I saw the smoke that we would have to get out. It didn't change anything. It was just a matter of now we're in a different attitude. We got to get out this airplane. And you were so, well, like they say, you were so busy, you didn't, you know, in trying to get that wounded guys out and trying to get everything out and do it right. And uh, you just were busy, busy, busy. So you really didn't have time to really worry too much about it. Sure. And so, I mean, you explained, you know, really well earlier 
how you hit the ground, the yep. German with the good dog found yeah. you. Yeah. You know, it's it's one thing to, to hear it, you know, it, but to or see it in a movie. But yeah. when you realize that you were now, you know, prisoner of the enemy, I mean, of, of the Germans, I mean, what was that like? Well, I'm not sure. It was just, I, I don't know, I can't say. It was just, we, I realized that I was a prisoner and I realized that this, you know, was, uh, and I'd read about Prisoners of War, you know, in the in the Civil War and and uh, in in the First World War. So yeah, I, I would just say, well, it was just gonna be a tough, hard go. And uh, I I don't think I really didn't scare me anything. I said, this is just it. I said, I just don't want them to kill, shoot me or kill me because I, I I I never gave up hope of coming getting home. I just kept I never even on that march when it got really so bad, I never gave up. I said, I know I'm gonna make it. Somehow I'm gonna make it, and, I, and that was—I think that was the attitude of most all of the Americans. We we gonna make it home. But I had no special feelings I can that I can remember when that happened, except it was something that you know you not often you got a gun pointing at you for hours at a time, or people you know treating you like they did. But you know what else could you do? It's like in the prison camp, they would come in and and and. Had the guy be waving his pistol? You ever? I said, you get up in the morning, you look at some uh, guy waving his pistol in your face, and you just get sort of used to it after a while. You just I don't want to do anything that makes him mad enough to shoot me. You know, it's easy for us looking back at the war to know that it started in '39, uh, it, it ended in '45. Yeah. But when you're captured in August of '44, uh, I mean, you had no idea when the war was going to be yeah, over. No. I mean, did it cross your mind that they might just, you know, eventually kill all the prisoners when you were a POW? No, no uh, I, I, mean, I just always believed we'd get home somehow. I just believed. I just said, we, I, we're not going. And I think most of the guys felt the same way, that, you know, we're going to make it. I mean, was it, a, was it your faith, or was it just, just I, that I, you knew I, America couldn't lose the war? Well, what, what we, we, just, we just kept thinking we're going we, we to win the war. We, we figured, well, we figured sooner or later we're going to win the war. That was for sure. That's what we thought. But we just thought we would win, and then we would be home, and that would be the end of it. You know? But, yeah, we always, we, I, I think we always thought we would go win the war. Sure. Uh, uh, so, you know, you, you explained earlier the interrogation process. Yeah. Do you remember the types of questions they would ask you what what were they what were the germans really curious to know they were actually what they were they were curious to know what what missions you had been on and what missions what was the what the, was the look at what the group were looking at in the future well the problem with that is i was an enlisted man so i didn't have any knowledge of what was going on you know i didn't know and uh but I wasn't gonna tell them I didn't know. I just did, I just answered my name, rank, and serial number because that was all was support. But they wanted to know all of the details about what was going on, and they wanted. I mean, basically, the engines. I'll tell you this about what the Germans did. On our airplane, and every airplane that's crashed in in Germany during the war, the Germans would come to that crash site, and they would take if it's an engine was in good shape, they would take that engine and they'd send it to an engine factory to look, to be sure that America didn't have something that they could use. And they would take a radio if, there was, if it was in good shape. They would take any of the instruments on the airplane, send it to a place to be analyzed to be sure it wasn't something that they could use. So they did that. I've got the, what they call the survey of our airplane, the, what the crashed the one that crashed. And in the survey, it makes a statement that two engines were damaged. Now, that was with the two that was hit by a flight. One engine was burned up. That was the one that was on fire. There was only one engine that they took off of there to send to, the, to have it checked. They did the same thing with the instruments, and they'd tell you which ones were beat up and which ones they could send. And, but they did this survey, and all they wanted to do was to try to find out what we were doing because they wanted to. to uh, uh, now, the one time that we... We didn't have any doubts, but one time that happened on one mission, and I forget which one it was, we were flying at about, oh, I guess we were about 25,000 feet or 28,000. We saw this vapor trail about 10,000 feet above us going in the same direction we were, and the vapor trail just went right on past us, just like it was a bullet. 
we didn't know we knew that there was no such airplane could fly that high or that fast. And we thought, well, that's some kind of bomb. When we went to interrogation, the first thing we asked the interrogator, what did that what was it? We saw it. And he says, I don't know what you saw. And he kept, we could tell he just didn't want to answer the question. So we kept asking him the same thing. So finally, he says, okay, it's what they call a jet. And the first thing we said is, oh, what in the hell is a jet? We never heard of a jet. And he then explained what that airplane was. The Germans had that jet airplane. As you well know, they had the first one that was ever used. And that was what we saw, was a jet airplane. And then we said, man, they don't believe it. You know, of course, then we couldn't believe that he actually said it was an airplane, but later we found out it was the truth. Yeah, supposedly if they got it earlier in the war, it could have, I, don't, I doubt it would have really changed the whole outcome, but it would have prolonged it. Would, it, it. it. Yeah, well, if, if, yeah, if, he, if that was a mistake that Hitler made, one of his mistakes. I think it's a pretty long list of mistakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh... So after you were interrogated, you talked about being sent to the POW camp. Yeah. Some of the other veterans who were prisoners who I've met, they talk about being worried about Germans putting in spies into the camps. Oh, yeah. So any new arrivals would be you know, separated from the rest of the men until someone could identify him. Yeah. Do you remember anything like that? Oh, yeah. I, I talked to, I don't know, what, two or three guys that they wanted to talk to me when we got in there. And they would ask you questions that probably, that, that, that was supposed to be that a German wouldn't know it. And they'd ask you questions, you know, like about baseball and all of this stuff, like uh, Babe Ruth and, you know, all this kind of, people that, was, that you would know. And, uh, and people would know back then, you know. And uh, so they asked different questions and that's that determined whether you were a German spy. Uh, whether it, at the time I got in there, it, maybe it was too late. I don't remember any German spies in our camp. But uh, they could have been, but we wouldn't have known it. But we, it, you talk about all this escape. Uh, up in, we were so far north, and the land was so cold, and we were so far away from everything. Can you imagine being in northeast Poland, for heaven's sakes, up there now, Russia, where, I mean, nothing. If you escaped, the weather was terrible. Where would you go? And where would the food and that dress? And, and it was so far to go, there'd be no way that you could do it unless you could speak English, uh, German, unless you had clothes that would fit in and you could fit in as a German or you'd never survive. It was better to stay in that uh, in, you know, in the camp. It's the same thing on the march. Now, you could have gotten away on the march, but it was better to be together than it was to try to go separate ways because you, you know, you'd get into too much trouble going your own way. That being said, were there any escape attempts that you know of? Okay, and the prison camp, none that I know of. None that I know of. They, I, I don't remember anybody even talking about the escape. I think if you go back and you read the book and the history about the great escape that they talked about with the English, the English that dug the tunnel and all that, when you think of how many actually got out of the camp, how many was captured, it was, you know, it was a, a fruit, fruitful effort. It was, it was really, they were worse off than they were when they started. It just, I, in the er, early part of the war, when you were flying basically over just France and you were shot down, you had a chance then to get to the underground and they would take you home, but somebody would have to do that. Once you got into Germany, there was no underground there and you had no help and you just, it was just a bottle, it was just that impossible to try to escape. Some people did, but it was mostly impossible. Sure. Um, you know, just regarding life in the POW camp, you know, how did you keep track of time? Well, you really didn't. It, it didn't. It, and it, it was just the most mundane experience. There was nothing you could do. We, we tried to play a little cards. And, uh, but I will say this, because cigarettes was the main bottom point. If you had cigarettes, you could you get little extra stuff because people would, would sell you stuff for cigarettes. Or, you know, give you a little bit of a candy bar or something for a pack of cigarettes, but or just a few cigarettes. But it was a, 
Back then, most everybody smoked, but then once we got into prison camp, we didn't have the cigarettes, so we basically just a very few, so you didn't smoke them, and they used them for, for barter, so you didn't want to smoke them up, you wanted to use them. But that was just, you did that between yourself. You didn't do that between the guard. Now, I'll tell you this story, and I, and I tell everybody I, that when you have a veteran tell his story, that's what he believes. That's what he thinks that happened. That's what he, th he knows that happened to him. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not exactly right, but it's what he remembers, and that's the only thing you can go on. But you see these stories about how, and you can read them, about how you trade candy bars to the uh, German uh, guards for eggs and stuff like that. In our room at the prison camp, it was a little small stove, about two and a half, three feet high, and about as big around as, I don't know, a good-sized pot. We didn't have frying pan. We didn't have, how would the world say, go ahead and trade the candy bar for eggs? How would you cook eggs? You know, you could eat them raw, I guess. Then, uh, but if you had a candy bar, then I don't know any soldier that wouldn't rather eat the candy bar than eat an a, a, a egg. And so uh, you see those things and you hear those things, but in reality, and in a prison camp, if I were to take a candy bar and go to a guard and offer the trade, all he'd do is take the candy bar and beat you up because he could hit you in the head. He, he could do anything to you, take the candy bar. Then he would go and call for a roll call, and that meant everybody would have to get out of the barracks. And then he would go in your room and search everything. He'd just tear it apart looking for stuff because he knew you must have some stuff hidden, and they would just take whatever they wanted. So it, it, to me... I don't know how people traded stuff with the yard because we certainly couldn't have done it at Starlog before, and we couldn't have done it on the on the on the march because there was nothing there that we, we had to trade. Sure, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, sir, did you notice anything in particular about the German guards? You know, there must have been some reason why they were not on the front lines, and instead. You know, guards. Uh, uh, most of most of the guards were older people, like Big Stoop. He wasn't a young man. He was a he was not he wasn't a real old guy. But most of our guards were older men or had been wounded or something like that. And uh, but now in start, some of it, the, the, as, as my understanding in the prison camp, the guards or whatever the commandant wants them to be. If the commandant is sort of a nice person, he doesn't want to be brutal they won't be he won't let his guards if the commandant is a mean vicious person he'll let them do what they want to do and there's no and they don't have any and they don't have to be accountable for whatever they do they could kill you they wouldn't uh, try they would do anything they'd just bury you and that'd be the end of it so the guards at Stalag Luft could do whatever they wanted to and they were sort of mean now like I say the biggest one and the meanest one was Big Stoop. And there's no question, that was a very vicious man. Now, the other ones were sort of vicious too, but at different. Some were, were much nicer than others, but most of them didn't treat you too good, and, and so you just stayed away from them. You just, during the, the day, you just try to stay away from the guards. You didn't want to talk to them because you couldn't talk to them because they could do whatever they wanted to. Can you tell us about any specific things you witnessed regarding the guards' brutality? What did you actually see them do? Well, I can tell you, I can tell you this. If they would, it depends on how hard or what they were beating you for, or what, not for what it would be, how, how, how vicious their attack was. But Big Stoop, if he were to beat up on a guy, he usually would incapacitate him for about a week. The guy wouldn't, the, the, the POW would have to be helped to the bathroom and stuff like that, because he wouldn't be, it'd have to be help eat, feed him and all this stuff. Because Big Stoop was pretty vicious with his brutality. And, uh, and some of the others were, but he was the worst of all. But, so, when, when, but when you ask that, that's, you see that, you, we saw that now. It wasn't like every day that you'd see that, but it, used to, it was quite often it would be. Like would, would Big Stoop use like a weapon? Just... Well, either he'd use a rifle butt or he'd use a little, uh, 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 what you call, billy stick. He, he carried a billy stick a lot. And he'd like to, his favorite way to hit you in the small of the back and hit you on the calf of the legs with that billy club. And he'd hit you on the legs till your legs would just be pure black. 
and he'd hit you in the back till you couldn't even hardly move. But he was, uh, when, he would, when he got that way, he was very vicious and a cruel person. But that was, you see, that was what you could witness. And, and I think most, most of the people there did because, like I say, everybody that went through that knew who Big Stoop was. What were the so-called transgressions that the POWs made that would make Big Stoop or other guards hit them? Well, not much of anything. All they could, they just could do it when they wanted to. And you, you would, cause the guards, we didn't, I can't remember anybody trying to bully the guards or trying to talk to them or anything, because you, you couldn't, there's no way you, you couldn't reason with them. You know, they did what they wanted to. Okay. Uh, on my last interrogation, that was when I was at the Dulog, the, the officer pulled out a piece of paper and he started reading it to me. And on it, it told me when I was when I was finished high school and where I went to college, and uh, when I got married, my wife's name, and he knew just about everywhere I'd been to, to uh, for training. And I thought to myself, he knew more than I did. And, uh, and it, all this time I'd been in that thing trying to, you know, not, I didn't answer the question. They kept asking the question. I guess they were trying to verify it. I don't know. How did they uh, get all this information, do you think? Well, I always thought they got it through press clippings. Back then, before the war and during the war, you could hire companies that would do press cl clippings, and they'd have people all over the country, and when they'd read the newspaper, if they saw an article about a soldier or something or something about the war, they'd cut it out and ship it to Germany you know, and send it to Germany, you know. And I think, I, I think that would be one of the ways they got all of that stuff. Because I interviewed another veteran who was a POW from a B-17, and he said the same thing. He said they had his high school transcript. Well, they, 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 I don't know how they got all that stuff, but I think they got it through, you know, newspapers and articles and stuff like that. But, but would, the, would the high school publish your transcript in the paper? I don't think so. I don't know how they would have gotten that. The other veteran, he thought it was the only thing he could think of is because he had a German, a teacher that was that was of uh, German descent. And m maybe that, you know, was a, a, someone like that, a spy. Well, don't, don't, like I say, I've always thought it was through press clipping, you know, the companies that would do that for a, as a job. Sure. But do you remember listening to Axis Sally? Oh yeah, yeah. You could hear, you could hear that. We didn't listen to her that much, but we once in a while we'd hear. But we didn't pay much attention to that. So, so going back to your time in, in the POW camp, sir, can you describe Big Stoop? What did, what did he look like? Well, other than just a big, huge man, like you say, he was like six, seven, six, nine, something like that. He was a. a Everything, big head, big, he was just a big bodied fellow. His hands were huge. And, uh, and that was basically, he was just a big, big, I guess, ugly old man. And, uh, and just, uh, but he was vicious and he was plenty strong. And, 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 and he was just really just, I don't know what, how else you could call it, all that cruel and, and type of person. Were there times that you yourself got you know, on the on the, on his wrong side, or do you always witness other people getting hit? No, it uh, it happened to me once, and that's enough. And I don't like to even, I, that's so much for that. Sure. So moving forward, can you describe the the actual security? Uh, you know, their fences. How did they keep you all okay. in there? Okay. All right, one thing. Let me mention one more thing about Big Stoop, and then I'll tell you about that. After the war, I hated that man with a passion. Now, I don't know what happened to, to Big Stu. You can hear all kind of stories that after he was, the day we were liberated, he was killed, and then later he was beheaded, and then later he was tortured, and later he was killed. So all through the years, he, he died many deaths. So how many times he died or where he died, I, of course, I don't know. But I know this, I hated that man and I hated him, and it was about two years after the war. And one day I was just was sitting there thinking about him and mad and hating the guy, and I thought to myself, you know, he doesn't know that I hate him if he's alive. And I says, he doesn't really care. I said, this hate in me, it doesn't hurt him, it hurts me. And I thought about that thing, and I said, you know, that was history. 
I couldn't stop what he did to me. I couldn't change what he did to me. I said, so just put it behind me. Just forget it. Put it back there and leave it. It's history. Just it, Don't worry about it anymore. It's just, it happened and, and nothing happens now. And that's the day when I did that, I got rid of that hate. And I'll tell you, I was a better person after that. But I hated that man and I finally got him out of my system and that was the best thing I ever did. You know, now you talk about how they kept you in, in the prison camp. The prison, each one of these loggers or compound had it, basically was their own little prison unto itself. And each one, they all had the barbed wires and all of the ice, you know, the, the type of barbed wires you see at every prison. Had the four uh, guard towers at each corner. But in our, and in, in those prisons, Starlog Little Four, inside of that wire, about, I'm, I don't know what it is, maybe uh, 15 or 20 feet inside of the wire, there was a little stakes about knee high and a cable, a rope that ran between these little stakes. It's just sort of a looping type thing that all inside about, I guess, maybe 10 yards or whatever, 15 yards from that main wire. That was called a dead line. The, tire, the, the guard tires, the machine guns were pointed down that line. If anybody stepped over that line, he'd be shot. Anybody, a guard would step over, he would be shot. It's called a deadline. It would, I always said it was the greatest barrier I'd ever seen, and it wasn't but about two foot high. And uh, after the war, I had never heard of it before. After the war, I looked it up and tried, it was used in the, re, in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, not in the Revolutionary It was used in the Civil War. In fact, it was used right in the city of Richmond at the, uh, Libby uh, prison right up there. And they used the deadline, and that was the first time. And I thought, well, it was really one of the best barriers, but they, they just had nothing in there but the barracks. They had the 10 barracks. They had two uh, uh, restrooms, if you call them that. There were nothing more than places for bowel movement and relieving yourself. They had two pumps, wells, that water, that's where you got your well. And that was it in the camp. Outside, and they had one little one little building at the gate. Uh, outside, they had what they call a hospital place, but there was no the doctor there had no medicine, no tubes, anything. I'll say this: anybody that left the compound and went to that hospital, we never saw him come back. Now, whatever happened to him, I can't tell you. But we, I never known anybody to go to the hospital to ever come back from the hospital. And all of the Germans, they lived you know, outside of the compound. But that basically was it. But they had guards in those towers all the time. Thank you for explaining that. You know, you all were young men, or, you know, men, uh, in these POW camps. And usually when guys get together, you know, you would talk about, you know, sports or, yeah. or women or what was the number one topic of interest that you all would talk about in the camp? Food. We were hungry all the time. We talked about food all the day. And I tell people we dreamed about it at night. Food, but as you get hungry, and you and you really, that's what you talk about. We talked about food, and it was just, uh, with the Christmas that we were there, when the Christmas season came, we said, well, we got to make us a, some, some kind of cake or something to eat. And we, we, we said we could make us some uh, something to drink, some kind of alcoholic beverage, and we put fruit and all kind of stuff. And we, it just wasn't a whole lot, it was just a very small amount. None of it worked out. It was just all this a joke, basically, more than anything else. But we tried to celebrate Christmas, but you couldn't do anything like that. It was just no way to do it. But it was just, it, but the topic basically it was, was always food when you, like I say, we talked about it all day just about, we talked about it and dreamed about it at night. Was there a particular dish that you were fantasizing the moment you came back to the States? I mean... I don't know, maybe it wasn't a hamburger, I guess. <laughs> but I don't know, I don't remember, but I would have think that that would have probably been one of the first. Yeah. But, you know, it was just, uh, it, but it was so, like I say, it, it started long before it was so cold. You really couldn't do a lot of things. It was just, you know, you didn't feel like it. You didn't have the energy to do it. What was the, 
was the clothing that you all had, and how did you uh, keep warm? Well, most of the clothes. That now, when we were on the airplane, I wore uh, heavy underwear, a pair of khaki pants, and a, just a sweatshirt. And uh, then we put on all those heavy clothes. Now, that was in the early part of it. Later, they did have what they call heated suits in the airplanes, but we used we we always used it. Had to wear the big old heavy padded clothes, so that was what we wore. And uh, and so when we got to the prison camp, the Red Cross had food, had stuff there, and every one good thing. Every now, now America gave it to the Red Cross, and so every one we had an overcoat, an army overcoat, and boy, that was a, that was really us survival because that really helped us survive but they had they shipped in a lot of the stuff army clothes and they shipped it in through the red cross and that's how we got the clothes but we once they give you the issue that all you got some of the veterans i've interviewed they mentioned that in the red cross packages there would be uh silk maps hidden or little things. I mean, do you notice anything like that? Well, I've heard that before, but I have never seen it. I've also heard that when they would send in soft balls, they would put stuff in it, you know, put hot it in it. And, but now I never, personally, I never saw any of that. I never had any reason to try to tear something apart to see if there was anything in there. Sure. There was, there was a, a few a group, a very small group, that claimed they had a radio. And once in a while, they would come into the, in the barracks and give you a briefing, they called it, the radio briefing. And, uh, but it really didn't tell you much. It was, did, you know, I, I didn't put a whole lot of faith in it because I, it was hard to, to understand how they could have a radio and the, how they could get it in there. But they, I'm sure they did have one. But, that, that was actually my next question. How did you all get news in the camp about the war? That was the only way. It was this group this group of prisoners that claim they listened into BBC and for a few minutes every day and they get and they would know how the war was going on but I you know who knew whether they had it right or not and so it did we most of I don't think most of us really paid a lot of attention to it we listened to it for you know, just to be able to hear what they said but the Germans didn't tell you anything in fact I can tell you this about the German in the prison camp there was a group of guys they decided that they wanted to try to have a worship service on Sunday. And so they asked the commandant if they could do it. He said, yeah, you could have, you could have it. So when the first Sunday they tried to get together, they had two or three guys, and they were going to try to have some type of worship service. There were guards in there. And so after about, I guess, 20 or 30 minutes, the guard made a stop. They said, you, y'all not worshiping anybody. Y'all just trying to plot on the escape or something and they would every Sunday they would do the same things. I'm assuming because you were in you know in eastern Poland uh, you didn't see any of the American or Canadian or British bombers flying over. No, we Did would, you ever uh, see Russian planes? No, we, well, once in a while you would see a plane come over and whether it would be Russia or whether it would be uh, English or what, uh, who, we didn't know. We Because you, you know they would most of the time if there were any Real activity, they'd make you go in the in the in the in the buildings, and you couldn't stay outside. But you very seldom. We were so far north and west that we saw very little of any of that. So, yeah, I guess you were in northwestern Poland, right? Well, actually, it was wasn't Poland then, but it was that's this country of Poland now. But it was in the. It was Romania at one, at that time when when Hitler took over. Then later became, but it was in the north. North, not the west, and northeast, and it was the furthest uh, toward Russia. Perfect. Okay, I just want to clarify that. I get tired. I get confused sometimes whether that's east or west. That's but it's, it's the, going to Russia is east from there. Yeah, it depends which way you look yeah. at it. But uh, but it's in right. It's in the northeast part of, of of what is now Poland, and not far from the Baltic Sea, and and I guess not far, but a hundred miles or so from the Russian border. So so you mentioned uh, earlier. Well, I guess the only other thing about POW life, um, when you were a prisoner, did you have any opportunities to shower or bathe? Well, we could bathe, but the way we bathed, we had this uh, basin in the, we didn't have showers and stuff. In every barracks, there was a one toilet, one room, there was a toilet with a couple of commodes in it and uh, 
uh, one of these uh, trough type urinal, and that was all they had. Now the water was all from the two pumps, and you could go out and take that that uh, basin and put water in it, and then you could. That's how you would take a bath or how you would clean yourself. But it, it would be 25 people in the room, so you didn't do it every day. You, you know, you're lucky if you did it once a week. But you know, you you, you go out and you get that and you take that and do the best you can. What did men do in the camp regarding the, their hair? I mean, did they all just let it grow long? Or? Well, just let it grow long. Just tried to cut it once in a while. I had a bed that was red. <laughs> I don't know why I never believed it. I'd say red, it was just sort of a, a reddish tint. But I grew, I had a bed that grew pretty good. Did you consider keeping it after the war? No, in fact, huh, when we were liberated, and uh, the first place we went in, and the, uh, the first the first little place, it was just all these little tents, and there were just cots lined up. And so I was in the first one. And so when I came out the shower, and uh, went and got in there, and the guy says, you don't, you're in the wrong place. He says, you don't belong. I said, yeah, I'm so-and-so. He said, what? And the guy turned to me, and he said, I thought you were an old guy. He said, yeah, you're no older than I am. And he, when I shaved the bed, he didn't even recognize me. By the way, I, wanted, I forgot to tell you, when they brought the food, when the prison camp would, would bring the food in and you'd have to divide it up, I was the guy that divided the food up in our room. And I'd spoon it up into 25 dishes. And they'd, they would watch like a hawk <laughs> and be sure they got their fair share. <laughs> and I divided the, 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 the Red Cross package. You know, you get like maybe two or three or four or five for the whole room, and I'd, I'd divide that up. You know, as best you can. But you better divide it up good. I said, well, they never fired me from the job, so I guess I did a pretty good job. But they were so, the guy was so shocked when I he got a haircut and a shave, he said, you just look so much older. <laughs> did you feel older? I mean, did you feel like you aged no. dramatically in the camp? No. Just for the record, how old would you have been when you were liberated? It'd be 20, I guess. Yep, I'd have been 20. Can you imagine everything we've talked about, you, you know, you did before you, you were, you could legally vote. You couldn't even <laughs> legally vote back then, right? Because you had to be 21. That's, yeah, that's or right. Or drink. Yeah. You couldn't vote or drink. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I meant to ask you, can you talk about your experiences with lice? That seems to be a big topic for a lot of the POWs I've interviewed. Uh, now, do what now? With lice. What, what do you remember oh, about the oh, lice? Oh, uh, Well, when you're in the prison camp, you would usually take out late in the afternoon, you'd take your, your clothes off, you'd take them off, like a shirt and your underclothes and all. You'd take them and you could just you'd kill the lice. You'd just find the little things and you'd spark them between your fingernails and you'd squash them. Now, that would, would, would do fine until about 4 o'clock in the morning. And then they, they would hatch out about that time every day. And when they'd hatch out, they'd start feeding and you'd just start scratching yourself. And then in the daytime, you'd go in and try to kill them. Now, on the, on the march, we just had them. It was just terrible. And you just, of course, you couldn't take your stuff off. You were out there in the cold and, and you just had to survive that best you could. There was a, a doctor, this doctor, his name was Kaplan. He was at the one that was in the prison camp and he was on this march. And he and his report that he wrote said that when somebody would really get sick, he would op open the, the shirt up. He said he'd have to scrape the lice off the, sh the chest in order to listen to his heart. That's how bad it was. That's the way he described it. I don't know if it was quite that bad with me, but it was, they were, it would just, it just itched like mad, that's all. And would this just be body lice or would you guys just also body get into the hair? No, no, body lice. It was just body lice. But it was more of an aggravation than anything else because it was just like, itch. you don't just have an itch and you just have to scratch and bed bugs or chickens or whatever you want to call them, that type of thing. And I'm assuming, you know, your whole time as a prisoner, you had the same clothes, right? Same clothes. In fact, when I took a bath, and we, like I said, we put all of it, everything, I put everything I had into that fire, that bonfire. And I took a bath, and when we came out to the bathhouse, there was a guy there, and he said, close your eyes and hold your nose, and he sprayed us. I mean, with powder from your head right to your foot. Everybody, every piece of your body was covered in that white stuff. And uh, I always said I thought it was DDT, but I'm not sure what it was, but whatever it was, it got rid of those lice, and that was worth it. No, I, I, I believe you're right. A lot of the veterans who I've interviewed, they talk about the DDT, because yeah. it, it wasn't known to be harmful back then. No, no. Uh, well, of course, nothing. Even like the keep on and all, they wasn't known to be harmful in Vietnam until, you know, after the war. And the Agent Orange, I guess, not the keep on. So... You mentioned earlier that in February of 45, the Russians were getting close, and that's when you guys started. That's February the 6th. That's, they, they completed, they, they emptied that camp, Stalag Lufo, on February the 6th. Can you explain, I mean, how did that actually happen? I mean, who came and told you, okay. this is what we're going to do? There was, I'd say around, but the first or second of, March, of February, 
they was to talk about that. You know, talking. They said, "Don't talk about evacuation." And then we noticed that they were started taking the, pe the sick up, and the people that couldn't walk and were sick, and they would we, they'd take them out of the compound. And of course, we didn't know what was happening, but we had rumors that they were going to evacuate it. So we thought that was what they were doing. That they did take them by truck and and train and moved them. And the reason they didn't take us by the people that could walk, they just didn't have that much train and truck power to do that much. And uh, they didn't want to leave the injured there, so they took them. But anyway, then that was that was all. For, that was about maybe three or four days we heard it before. And then the night before that, they told us, you leave it in the morning. The guards told us that. Where did you think you were going to go? What do you think? I well, you like, that? They, they told us, they didn't tell us anything when they first told us. But on the march, one of the guards said, we go into another prison camp, and it'll be three months. But I'll tell you... Uh, no, no, wait. I'm sorry. I think you meant three days. I mean, I'm sorry. Three days. You're right. In three, three days. Three, just, three days. And we walked. It was, it was 87 days that we walked. Can you go back and just say that? That because that, that's a really great line right there. But, but the God tell. Right on the mark, that first day, the God, our God told us that we would be marching for three days. We would go into another prison camp. The three days ended up being 87 days of marching. Uh, and you know. Can you just take us through a typical day on the march? What do you, what, what happens? Okay. They would, you'd wake up, of course, you'd, you'd, you'd be awake most of the time anyway. And, uh, because first now at night, you had the three blankets. And regardless of where you were, if you were even in, a, in an old bombed up factory or in a, a stable or wherever, or barn, or on the ground or in the wood, if you, it'd be so cold and the three of you would get real close together, that's the reason you had the three blankets and that's the reason you had the combine. One blanket with one man would, I think, would have froze to death. But, so it'd give you warm, warm heat. The guy in the middle, you'd have to change uh, twice in the night. You'd have to move over and the guy would get in there. Each one would stay in the middle of half, a third of the night. <laughs> so you get it warm in the middle of the night. I mean, that was sort of unusual, but we would, Sleep and wake up, and you'd wake up, you know, shortly after day, or you'd get up, and uh, you'd scrounge around. If you had anything to eat, you would try to find it, or you would eat it, or you'd just get water and drink it, whatever. Then the guard would would hustle you out and line you up in the street, and you'd it'd be about four or five abreast marching down the highway, and you just take up most of the street, or not the highway, the road, and then they'd just start marching you, and the guards would be on both sides of you and telling you where to go. And you just keep walking, and you just walk. And once in a while, they would stop. Like at midday, they might stop and let you sit down. You know, from time to time, they would stop and let you rest a little bit. But you would go until the day was basically was out. And some days it would be five miles, and some days it could be twenty-five miles. You know, nobody they didn't know either. And it was just zigzagging. And uh, there were groups now. Oh, let me finish the board. You, you, and in this march, they didn't really know where they wanted to go, and so they would. The guard would just go this way, and then if that wasn't right, they'd back up and go some other place. And uh, they were just trying to keep you away from the cities or the people, and the town, because they didn't want you know they just didn't want us to get in there. But there were so many of it, like at Stalag Lift Four. I don't know how many groups it was. It was many groups. If you take 6,000 and you were doing 300 in a group, it, that was a lot of people. But we were not the only prison camp that was evacuated. There were many, many prison camps. Now, the reason most of them were evacuated because these pants were loaded, were located in the west, in the eastern part of Germany or in the eastern part of Russia, just as, uh, not Russia, of uh, Poland and this type of place, as far to the east as they could. The Germans wanted to keep us away from the American troops coming from the, from the west to the east. Then when they didn't count on the Russians coming, when the Russians got there, they decided that's why they evacuated. So they evacuated all of these camps that were up near the Russian border. And so they were doing the same thing we were doing. So you just people, you'd cross each other's line. You'd just, you, know, you could end up in the same town and, or, and, and you could, if you wanted to, you could have changed from one group to another group. But you could have done it very easily. But you stayed with, you wanted to stay with people you knew. You know, how did the guards treat you all on the actual march? 
Well, all they did, they didn't, they didn't do too, they didn't do anything for you. They didn't have anything. They, they were having a time surviving themselves. So they didn't have, they had to pick up food when they went through a town and they could get food. They could stop and get food from people. So they kept their, their food for themselves, but they didn't give us anything. They just, they didn't, uh, they didn't treat you too good. They, they, they would, but if you got out of line, they would, would, would beat up on you, hit you with sticks or the rifle butts or whatever they happened to have. But they kept you pretty much under control. But you did, like I say, you didn't, you wouldn't gain anything by leaving the, the column. You'd be in worse shape than you. You know, but but the men who just were exhausted because of the lack of food. But that's right. Who were tired. The men who fell down. What would happen to those prisoners? Well, most of the time, they, <clears throat> those that fell out of the, the column and couldn't go anymore. Most of the time, a guard would stay with them for a while. But. I don't remember seeing many of the people come, the, the prisoners come back to the line. I don't know where they went. I don't know what happened to them. I know I, I, I could. People give all kind of reasons and what happened and where they went and what happened to them. I don't really know. And I, for first-hand knowledge, I can't say. I, all I know is a kid could drop out of the, the formation and I'd never see him again. You know, some of the veterans I, I inter have interviewed who've been on these marches, they talk about. Uh, actually seeing the guards killing the men who fell. I've heard that too. And it you believe may, that would be true? I, I guess it could be. I, you know, like I said, I wouldn't doubt what they say because, you know, I wasn't there and I don't remember, you know, I don't remember doing it. If it happened, I just don't remember it. But uh, I can't complain. In fact, a good friend of mine uh, that was on our march says that that's what happened. But, and maybe he must have known because I, he's, he certainly, I don't think he would exaggerate it, but he, for some reason, that's what he thought. But I had never heard or seen or could say that that's what happened. All I can tell you is this, when the fellow fell out of the formation and didn't, couldn't make it and nobody was there to help him, then the guard would be there and that would be the last I'd ever see of him. You'd see the guard come back, now that was a fact, but you wouldn't see him. I also wonder if maybe they just were left there. I don't know. It could be. Uh, they could have been killed. It could, you know, you just don't know what they did. I mean, but would you all try to help the prisoners who, well, the only thing, who were struggling? Well, you, you had this combine, and, and, and you, it, you basically couldn't help. You, you were lucky just to help each other because you, 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 you wanted to survive. And so you basically, that, that's why you did the combine. If, if you could, you would help a person, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't stop if a fellow fell down or something like that. You know, you might help him get up, but if he couldn't get up, you wouldn't stay with him because the guards wouldn't let you. Sure. Um, in the 87 days that you were on the march, were there any times the guards actually gave you all legitimate food to eat? And not just scraps, but in the proper... Well, it, I... I can't remember, but I'm sure they, they. I don't. I don't remember them giving us any food. I can't remember them. The guards that were because they they didn't really. There was no way for them to have food other than what they could take in their back sack for themselves. So I mean, can can you talk? I know you mentioned this earlier, but can you go in a little more detail? You're in a foreign country. You know, how would you actually find food? Well, on, on the and it's not like you can go anywhere. You have to stick to this road area. Yeah. Where, what would you find? Well, the problem, you, you would have to go to a, a store or you have to go to a home to get food. I don't know where else you would get it, just, you know, if you were looking, if you were trying to find the food. Now, on the march now, we did have a, a couple of times, but once in particular, this one lady was there and, and her home was right around the street and, and uh, she gave us some milk. She had this big pail of milk and as we were walking by, she'd pour a little milk in your cup. And uh, that was the only time that any civilian ever gave us anything. But now she told us on the march, and this was toward the end of it, she did tell us when she gave us the stuff, she would, that I found out she was a school teacher, and she was telling us, I heard her say that, boys, just tough it out, it won't be long and you'll be home. And so that was, on the march, that was the only thing we heard about, you know, the war coming to an end. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that was the only time a civilian gave you food. Did, uh, yeah. you, did you see or have any interactions with other civilians? Various few. Some of the farmers, you, you know, you'd see, but I did, personally didn't have any re, any reaction at all, any action with any of them. As you were going through 
you know, Germany. Oh, you, know, you didn't see many people, very seldom did you see, because you didn't, wasn't big towns, it would just be small towns mostly. But, but as you were going through Germany, did you see any of the destruction done by the, the bombing raids? Uh, you, you could see some of it, and, but we were, saying, we were mostly in the country, so you didn't see a whole lot of it. Sure. I was just trying to, you, now, you mentioned earlier, this we, is when you when you first talked to us about your march, that's the time you mentioned the roots, right? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. When you talk about getting the roots from the, the plant? Yeah, that was in, uh, that was while we were in the early part of the march. Has he told you guys anything about what I, I'm just trying to understand what the actual food was. I mean, you can't go 87 days what, without something. Well, what, now, the, what food we got was what we could, could, steal or take from the farm from the farmland like sweet potatoes or these uh, sweet sweet uh, these beets this what they call a sweet beets and then that type of stuff was easy to get and uh, then you could then you could get sometime you could get a you know a chicken you could maybe get a chicken or something but the problem is that on the march you how were you going to cook anything that you had so what you did you did the best you could but cook it but you, you really didn't get anything cooked, really cooked. So you're eating really basically most of the stuff was raw stuff that you'd eat, but you'd eat whatever you could get. Chicken would be good if you could find some. And uh, you even like, and I hate to say this because I, I, it's just hard to talk about it, but dogs and cats and, and worms and stuff like that, you ate whatever you could find. But how, how would you how would you cook that the chicken and the the dogs and all that? What's that now? How would you cook that the animal? You wouldn't. You'd, you'd build a little fire and you try to you clean them up and you try to sort of you know do the best you could with what you were doing. And you didn't you didn't eat that much because by the time you you know there's so many guys you just get a small amount. But it it. it of course, you had dysentery all the time, so it didn't make any difference. You eat that kind of stuff, and that just creates more problems. But when you get it, you just you go. You certainly would eat it. And but you didn't get that much. We just most of it came from from like I said. We got a little bit of the Red Cross parcels, and we got a little bit of stuff we could sneak on the road and stuff like that. And I'm assuming when you're on the actual march and you have you know oh. bouts of dysentery, you can't stop, right? You you just continue to march. Just or? keep walking. You just relieve yourself right on the road, and then they, they wouldn't bother you while you were doing that, and then you'd have to run to catch up. And you know, keep marching. And and typically, you know, in those eighty-seven days, were there times that you guys had to sleep outside at night, or oh, yeah. were you guys always able to find some? Place? Oh no, no, no. We slept in the fields, and we slept in woods, and we slept in barns. And, and in fact, one night we slept in a bombed-out factory, and uh, well, it was on the edge of a pretty fair-sized town. But we didn't go into town. We went into that bombed-out factory. In fact, we got there fairly early. And so they decided that was the end of the day. So it was a short day. If we got in that barn and we wanted, we, we in the bombed up factory, and you had to get on the second floor. And by the time we got up there and got places to lay down to rest, uh, American Air Force came by and they were bombing that town. And so man, we all got out of that thing, and we were running out of the, the factory. And there was a ditch, up, you know, about like from here to the, across the road or something. So we were going to get in that ditch. And I remember when we got in the ditch, that was a, one of the guards was in the ditch. <laughs> we, he and uh, we were all in the ditch with the guard. And they were just, that's a, worrying about the bomb. And when the bomb was over, we went back into the place. But we spent the night there in that bombed out factory. But we'd spent a number of nights in, in barn farm, you know, the farm like and go out. But right now, I don't remember it too much because, but anyway, they've read about how the farmers wouldn't let us sleep in the new hay. You have to sleep in the old hay because he didn't want us contaminating his hay. <laughs> and I mean, and when you guys would stay in these buildings at night, uh, when you had to relieve yourself, you couldn't go anywhere, right? That's right, you'd have to go to the corner of the building or go something, you know, in another part of the building if you could. I mean, it's not just that you're a POW, but the, the, the fact is the way the Germans treated you yeah. all, it degraded you to almost like an animal. Well, that's a fact. They, they, they just were, you, well, that's the way they, they did people. That's the way the Germans treat, treated them. And, uh, what, what were your thoughts about, not just being stupid, but Germans in general, sir, after the war? Well, 
I guess after the war, you know, we, we, we didn't run into Germans until many, many years after the war. And by that time, it, you know, that was all history. You didn't really, it wasn't any bad thing because they had redeveloped the country and all that stuff. But you, we didn't, I don't remember seeing a lot of Germans right after the war, you know, or, or being, seeing any foreigners other than just, well, none really, until much, much later. But, I mean, did you ever, like, try not to buy German products or anything? No. Because, you know, a lot of the other veterans... Who well, to... uh, now, what I, what I always hated was people that bought uh, foreign automobiles. I always thought that was sort of ridiculous. I always wanted to buy an American car. But not to, not to do. But I just thought that the American car, I'd rather have it than have a foreign car. But that, that was just... Sure. And I guess it... it the American car, uh, the farming, foreign cars didn't really take over until the, uh, they got the Volkswagen, until they got the Beetle. When they brought the Beetle in this country, that's when people started really buying foreign automobiles. And then they bought the, the big ones, you know, for, for show more than anything else. Well, we're, we're almost done. I, I just, I want to cover a little bit about your growing up years, but oh, yeah. you know, then, then, then we'll, we'll pretty much be done, sir. Okay. But if you wouldn't mind, you don't need to repeat the whole story, but could you tell us the liberation thing again? But I just, when I edit this together, like I said earlier, you, you said it was the 101st, but it's really oh, the 104th. Okay. okay. And I oh. want this to portray you, you know, in a good way. Okay, sure, I okay. get if, So if you could just... Uh, Take us through the liberation story. Okay. And it was the, but you're right. It's called the Timberwolves. They were the hundred and fourth. Hundred and fourth Timberwolf to me. Okay. So I'll, right. I'll ask you. So okay. Well, take us through, sir. Okay. How were you liberated? Okay. Well, as we were walking from to the east, and we approached Bitterfeld, Germany, we ran into General Patton's one o fourth. Timberwolf Division and were liberated by his troops on February the 26th, 1945. No, no, no you said one month. What, what was the month? Oh, a, that was fe, uh, uh, a, uh, April. April. Right? April. No, no, I'm sorry. It's February, it was February, it was February, March, April. April the 26th. I'm sorry. Here, sir, just hang tight one sec. Just take a, a swig of water. Just get into the liberation story. Uh, what was the name of your plane? The Daisy May. How did that name come about? I, I don't know. The, pe the people that first started flying that airplane named it Daisy May. And they put it in her picture, had a picture painted on the nose. Was she pretty? Uh, well, it, it, she was a, it was a cartoon. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, could you tell us about when you were flying in the B-24, what was your other role besides being in the nose? What else did you have to do during a mission? Well, I was the armor gunner on the, on the mission, and after we get airborne, I would have to arm the bombs, and I, that, I, we did that. I did that by going back into the bomb bay, and the doors were closed at this time, of course. But I went back, and I had to take the car key out the back of the fin, and then unscrew the fin out so that that would arm the, the bomb, and when it would drop, it would it, it would uh, you know, explode. If you didn't take that car key out and didn't arm it, it wouldn't do anything. So that, I had to do that every every on every mission once we got airborne, and uh, that was the biggest thing back there. But I, I've been I've been on that catwalk when the doors were open. In fact, like the day we were shot down, they were open because there was so much f f gas fumes in it. That they had to open it up to keep you know, to get fresh air, and so when I went when I went from the nose to the tail, and they were shot down, it was open. And I tell people I was holding on with white knuckles going through that bomb bay. I mean, how, how high is the railing to prevent you from? Well, falling? no, you had struts that you would hold on. It wasn't in the railings in it. It was just a just a thing with these struts that came up, and that was held the thing in. How often would the struts? Be oh, they were. I don't know, I would say four or five feet apart, something like that. You can reach and hold them. You so can. there's a definitely enough room for a person to fall. Oh yeah, you could fall out of that. Oh, in fact, it is the people that were about what? They were about, I don't know how many jumped out. They jumped out through the bomb bay. You could just go in there. There was enough room in there. You could get out easy. That's like a human bomb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I did mean to ask you that the when your plane was shot down, you mentioned that 
because the the bombardier the navigator I believe thought that you were the one who called up for help they pulled yeah. you out and right after they pulled you out the nose took a hit right from a shell yep and it, it destroyed it destroyed the nose turret yeah I mean do you believe if you were still in there you would have been killed I guess so I you know that People asked me that before. I said, you know, how would you know? You know, you just, you, you uh, certainly you would have been uh, injured, I'm sure. But whether you've been killed, I don't know. Like, it's not like it blew the nose off. Well, no, no, it just shattered. You know, different things were just shattered in it. Wow. Of course, the air was coming through it pretty good. And so, uh, the only other thing is, how did you, uh, did you send letters to your family as a POW, and did you that, get any? Sir? No, I, I wrote letters. They would, give, they would let you write so many letters and so many postcards every month, which was just a few, one or two. I ne and I wrote, wrote those, and, they, and my mother and my wife got a, a few of those cards. I don't say, well, I wouldn't say half of them, maybe a fourth of them. But, then I never got anything. I, my wife and my mother, they would send me these food packages just as often as they were allowed to be done. You, they, you couldn't send but so many. And they would send them and they would write letters, but I never got one letter or one, no information at all from home during that time. That was perfect. Mm -hmm. So what we were doing earlier was, if you could tell us that liberation story, but it was the 104th Division. Right. Sir, can you take us through, uh, how were you liberated? On April the 26th, 1945, we were approaching the town of Bitterfeld, Germany. And at that junction, the German guard surrendered. They surrendered to the American forces, the General Patton's 104th, the 104th Temple Wolf Division. And that, that day, that afternoon, I was standing on the side of the road is when I realized that we had, we had experienced, we were through, we had, what we had done, we had just walked over 500 miles, some people say it was 600 miles. We had lost a third of our body weight, we had been walking for nearly three months, we were filthy dirty because we had, most of us hadn't had a bath, we were sick and we were hungry, but we were free. And I still, I've never been able to really express that feeling that I had that day. And that night, the, the frontline troops did not eat their dinner. They let, let us have their dinner. There were more of us than it was of them, but we still had a good food to eat. After we ate the food, the medics came by and told us we'd have to throw it up. We couldn't keep that rich, rich food on our stomachs because the next day we'd be sick. And so that, we did that, and the next day the Air Force flew us out of Bitterfeld and flew us to Camp Lucky Strike, a multi-purpose Army, American Army camp, not far from Paris. And that's where we ended our, uh, we were liberated. And, and so, I mean, I know you, you touched on this, you know, you, after being a prisoner of war, you know, you're now free and you have you know the whole world in front of you and your whole life ahead of you um for people who have not been prisoners of war who can't really understand that feeling is there any way you can you know make it easy for people to digest and, and put themselves in your shoes well i'm not i don't know if i can do that but i can say this i would certainly being a prisoner of war and being locked up is just not a, a, a good thing for any human being. But it was something that happened, and then once it happened, it was over with. It was over with. When I returned home after the war, and and I got out of the service, we I was not a military man. I wasn't. I, that was certainly not a, something I wanted to do. We were civilian soldiers, and we everybody was so happy just to get out of the war and go back to their life. We wanted to live our life. And we were young enough just to start. We were just beginning our adulthood. I was married during the war. So when I got home, I knew I had to make a living for my wife and myself. And that's what I, I started off working is in an in a oil delivery company. And I worked there for, oh, I guess, six months or so. And uh, 
that's when I decided I wanted to do something better, and that's when I decided I wanted to go to college. And my wife and myself decided that was a good thing to do. And so I applied to the college, and I went to college, and she says, I'll work while you're in college. And so we, so you can go to college, and when you finish, you'll get your degree. She says, I'm going to quit working, and I'm going to raise my family. And that's exactly what she did, and that's what we did. Do you have any difficulties readjusting to civilian life? No, the, the, only, the only thing that I had is it took about two years to be able to eat most anything I want, particular fried food. For the first year and a half, you, I could only eat boiled stuff. It was just, your stomach just wouldn't, I don't know what it was. I had a hard time with indigestion and this type of stuff, but it took about two years, and that was the worst aftermath of the war with me was my health and, and trying to you know, get back to eating normal things. But after about two years, I, I was back on track and doing okay, but that was, I didn't have any other mental problems, anything other than just that stomach problem. Loud noises or anything? Nothing, nothing, you? nothing, nothing bothered me. And I, I, I don't remember all these nightmares. I don't remember that. I do know that at times I would wake up in the night and my wife would wake me up and say, wake up, wake up, you're having a nightmare. But I can't remember any of them. Sure. But I, I don't know I, I don't know what, what it was or anything else. She never said anything about it. She just said, just wake up, you're having a nightmare. And, uh, but I don't remember that. I don't remember any of that. But I didn't have any problems at all other than just the, that you know, stomach problem for, had a, for a year and a half or two years. If you could go back and tell us, uh, how did you first meet your wife? What was her no, name? Uh, and well, we were in high school together. And... Uh, she was one year behind me, and uh, it's like we've talked about it forever. Is uh, we would date each other, then we would go off and we'd date other people, and then we'd come back and date some more. And I kept saying one time, why do we keep coming back to each other? But that's what we did in high school. When I left and went to college, I went to, like I said, I went to Presbyterian College. When I went to, went to college, I guess the separation is where we really fell in love when I was there, because that's where I really reckon, well, this is who I would want to live with the rest of my life. And that's where I think we really, you know, it, we understood that was what it was going to be. And then when I was drafted, uh, I, because then we had planned I'd finish college and then we would uh, see from that. But because we still, when I went to college, we still didn't think the war to go back when, before the war, the army started a draft, and they would draft soldiers or draft people, and for one year. At the end of the one year, you were through, you go home. So I didn't, I didn't even think, I thought the war would be over, and I wouldn't even be called up to the draft. I didn't even think I'd have to go to the draft. And I said, well, if I do, it's only one year. So we were thinking, okay, we'll fin I'll finish college and all of this, and then we'll get married. Well, then when I was drafted and I was in the war, then we got really serious and we decided that, uh, that this is what we wanted to do. I didn't want to get married f at first, and I told her, I said, I, don't, I think it's not fair to you because if we get married and I'm in the Air Force and I don't come home, I said to be a widow during that period of time was a terrible life. I mean, nobody, for some reason back then, they treated widows differently than they do now. And I said, you just have a hard life, you know, that you'd have to support yourself forever. And so I sort of hesitated, but she said, no. She says, if we don't get married, she says, and something happens to you, she says, I'll never forgive myself because you're the man I want to marry. So we decided to get married, and we did. We got married on a, on a, a actually, it was a five-day pass for, to get married. You could, you could do that then. And uh, so we had a three-day honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we did live together. We lived together for about two weeks, and I think it was in Texas. And then later, we lived for about three months together in Pueblo, Colorado, when I was in phase training. The Army would let you live off base during that period of time, and so I went to an apartment, and a, a, home, a, a, a room in a home, and we lived there. And by the way, the people we lived with in Pueblo, we became very close friends and we lived with them just like part of their family and they became lifelong friends. Sure. 
uh, is this another service member? That no, they, they, no, he worked. He worked for the. He worked for the military at the air base, but he he was not in the military. Do you remember when when you went overseas? I mean, the last time you saw your wife. Was it was that with the, was she with your family or did no? The last like, before I went overseas, when we left Pueblo, I was was be transferred to Kansas City. This was a, I guess I'm not sure just way it's a stopover that you had to do in the army, and so she was going home. And of course, by then that time of the year, a civilian only way they could travel was by bus. They couldn't use the trains because the army used the trains, and there was no such thing as airline. So she had to ride the, the Greyhound bus. So that morning, uh, uh, I left the day before to go to Kansas City. The next day, she was leaving Pueblo to go home. So she had got to the bus station, and she had already checked the bags and everything. And I happened to realize then, I was at the Kansas City Air Base, that we were supposed to be there for about a week. So I called her, and I told her, I said, don't go back to South Carolina, come to Kansas City. So she got on the next bus and came to Kansas City. No luggage, no nothing. And, but we thought we'd have another week. We had one night. And I had to, the next day I, they shipped us out. And that was the last time I saw her until I got home. That was some pretty emotional time, not knowing we'd yeah, ever see her oh, again. Well, that's the truth. It was just, we, uh, of course, I had to leave about four o'clock in the morning. And so yeah, it was, it was it was a tough time. But anyway, we knew we we still I still I just figured we'd be back together. You know, we just I didn't think about not coming home. Sure. What was her name? Her name was Jacqueline Cook Harper. But uh, she the first time she'd ever been out of the, when she came, the first time she came to see me the first time she'd ever been out the state, and when she came to Pueblo, she was on the bus for three days and three nights. And uh, when she got to Pueblo, she had pneumonia. <laughs> oh. Poor child, she was really sick. But anyway, that was just part of life. Uh, great, thank you for sharing that, sir. I just wanted to backtrack uh, just a little bit about your growing up years. Uh, you mentioned earlier about your family and the depression oh. and all that, but did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I, I had two sisters and three brothers, and all four of us were in the Army. Now, like I said, I was in the Air Force. My oldest brother was in the Air Transport Division, and he was he flew in the uh, P forty, uh, not the P forty seven, the, the uh, transport, and uh, so he flew out of Burma over the Hump, which was the uh, I forget the name of the mountains, but they called it the Hump, and he flew the uh, equipment from to the Chinese and to the American armies based in China. And that was what the hump was, and it's quite a few people were in that air transportation travel. But he flew over 100 missions flying. He was a navigator on the 46 or 47 transport. I forget what they called it. C-47. C-47. But anyway, then my ne next oldest brother, he was in medical school at the time, and when he stayed until he finished, and when he got, to, when he got his degree, he was enlisted in the Navy, and he was shipped to Philadelphia. He was assigned to a ship in the Atlantic Ocean, but they, uh, they, they know, by that time the war was nearly over. The youngest brother, when I went, when I was a prisoner, he was at college at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. He graduated, and then he was drafted into the Army, and he was sent to Italy, and he was in Italy for a short while until the war was over. Did, did he see action or? No, he actually was no action by that time. It was a, basically, it was just about all over. But that was the brothers there. Now, I had uh, one cousin that was much older than I was, and so he joined the Navy quite early. And, and this was, oh gracious, I guess in 41. This was, I think this was even before Pearl Harbor. No, it couldn't have been. It had to be right after Pearl Harbor. But. He was he got in the Navy and they didn't have the ships that they would have. They had an old freighter, and they tried to camouflage it and make a some type of a armored ship and cannons on it and stuff like that. The idea was that this ship would go out into the ocean, and the sub the sub German submarines instead of finding a torpedo and wasting a torpedo, they would surface. And when they would surface, this ship could sink them. Well, it didn't work that way. When he got in the ocean. 
the torpedo hit the ship and sunk it, it was, and they, his ship was sunk 30 miles off the coast of Norfolk on his first trip, and everybody on the ship died. What was his name? It was Edward Madison. His name was, uh, oh gracious, I can't remember his first name. Edward Madison, uh, they lived in, the family lived in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, His mother was my father's sister, and I can't remember the last name right now to say but that. Now I had another cousin, and they lived in King Street, South Carolina, which was just a short ways away from where we, where I was born. And his name was Bob Montgomery. When I went to college, he was my age, so he went. To, he was at college, so we both went to TPC. We became roommates, and he ended up. And he was drafted the same time I was, and he was assigned to the army. And he he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And he had a he had a younger brother that was in the Eighth Air Force. And at the, about the same time, he his airplane took a lot of damage. It wasn't shot down. Took a lot, but he lost a leg in that flight. And his mother got the two telegrams the same week, one in the first of the week, one in the last. The first one was that a son had lost a leg, and the last, next one was another son was killed at the Battle of the Board. I mean, she must have been a changed woman after that. Well, she, I guess people did what they had to do, you know, and it, it hurt. I can remember that my wife, after I was shot down and was, listed as missing in action. My mother and father went and got my wife and said, Daddy says, I want you to all to come home. And he brought all of the wives home. He brought all of the daughters home. He said, he said we need to be together until this thing is over with. And so I never forgot that, you know, and that really made a big difference. But my wife would always would go to, she would, when she would really feel bad about what was happening, she told me later, she says, I, she says, I'd go to your mother and she would hug me and she would tell me and, and give me comfort. She said, not one time did I ever think about how, how hard it was hurting her too. And she hurt, but she never showed it. So I think that they just, at that time, women just didn't show their emotions. But I'm, I'm sure, I mean, your mother would have been so elated that all four boys came back. Oh yeah, well that was really great, yeah. Now, obviously, you all didn't come back the same day. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, it was a long time coming back because I was the first one. And uh, I guess the one in the Navy probably was the last one to come back. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, there's a, a couple, you, you've done wonderful. You've done, you're doing wonderfully. Huh? There's a couple reflection questions, but just give me a minute. Just take a, take a break. Okay. I, I, say that again? I, I said, I, when I, while, while my wife was living with my parents, she always said that was her second parents because they were so good to her. But she would say that daddy and would, every night they would take a map out, they had a map of Germany, and they kept a record of where the war was going on from through the radio. I meant to ask you, sir, your, your, buddy, your cousin, rather, uh, Montgomery, yeah. um, can you tell us about him? What what kind of person was he? What was unique about him? What you know? Well, but the biggest thing that was unique about Bud was he was just laid back. Nothing seemed to bother him, and except he was one. He was a excellent baseball player, and he played on the he played on the high school team and he played on the college team, and he was a third baseman. But he was really un, he he was a great baseball player, and. Uh, but he was just laid back and nothing bothered that boy. And uh, in fact, they say that he was in a foxhole when he was killed in the Battle of the Bulls. But he was, just, he was just a nice old country boy. And your older cousin, Edward Madison? Uh, now, now I, I knew very little about him. He was the oldest one of the cousins, and I, I knew very little about him. Leonard was his last name. Edward Madison Leonard, his father's name was Leonard. And uh, if, I know you mentioned this earlier, but I, I, I want to get on this version. Can you just tell us that story of uh, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Oh, uh, you want me to go through that again? Just the part, because that it, uh, okay. it, it was your wife, right? Yeah, yeah. When, when, oh, when the day that the Pearl Harbor attack occurred, my brother, my oldest, one of my older brothers and myself were 
would, we had dates that afternoon. It was a Sunday afternoon. We had dates. We were riding around town. We were listening to the big band music on the radio, and they interrupted that program and announced the Pearl Harbor. We didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. We just figured it had to be in the ocean somewhere. And uh, then we thought, well, maybe it was Hawaii, but we didn't even, we'd never heard of Pearl Harbor before. And, uh, but those two girls that we were with would become our wives. I mean, what, what was that like, you know, as a young man to hear that your country had been attacked? Well, we didn't, we just said, well, the old Japs just sneak attack. And uh, they were bad people, but we didn't really, you know, we didn't think of, like I say, well, I was in high school, you know, and, and so we didn't think about what the war was going to happen. And he, like I say, my brother was in college, I was in high school, and we just said, well, it, you know, it'll be over with before we'll be in the war. So we just didn't think anything about it. It was just, well, I don't know, it, we were just not impressed with it. Because back then you had very little national news, and so you really didn't know what was going on in the world anyway. Yeah, that was perfect. And, and just repeat this list, little thing. Uh, tell me, sir, where were you when you heard about the war ending and the atom bombs being dropped? Who were you with? Oh, I was, I was at home after I was liberated and returned to the States. And I was home on a, a long furlough. In fact, it was like a, it, I was there for like six weeks. I was there for, for, the first furlough was for four weeks. They extended it by two. During those last two weeks, my wife and myself were in a swing underneath a grape arbor in the backyard at home, at my mother's and father's home. And we were there listening to the radio, and we heard the news that they had dropped a bomb and, it, and uh, the Japanese had surrendered that. We didn't hear much about the first bomb on the news. It was just, they just didn't say it, but the second bomb, when they surrendered, that's when we knew that it was surrendered. And so you were with your wife. I was with my wife at home. When on the, for, when on the for. war started and when the war ended. That's right. I was you had about that. The, you all were preparing. I mean, had you mentally prepared that you were going to go and fight the Japanese? No, no. Oh, no. Oh, you mean, I, 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 I knew I was going to be going to the Pacific. And I knew I'd be trained for the invasion, and I just figured I'd be part of the invasion, and we'd do the same thing there as we did in in Germany. You know, it, that, was just, that was my mindset at that time. That, you know, we'd just go do what, what else we have to do. I, I know. I interviewed a soldier who was fighting in the Philippines, and he said they had a, a saying, Golden Gate in 48. Uh -huh. You know, because they just thought the war was going to go on forever, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's where they sailed under. Yeah. So... Uh, the only other thing, sir, is what life advice do you want to give to future generations? Well, I just think that the, that the best thing for people to do is just do the right thing and, and realize what you have and, uh, and be contented with it. You know, people in this country, you can find poor people, you can find rich people, you can find smart people, you can find dumb people. You just do what you can do with your life and enjoy your life as best you can. And nobody else can, can live it for you. And you live it and you, you trust you, you, what you're thinking, but just do the right thing and it'll all, I think it'll work out. And I'll have, I still have optimistic view that, that the, the generations to come will make this country even bigger and better at, at every, every generation. I just believe that will happen because I saw that in my lifetime from, from the very beginning to now and I've seen so much changes in this country and it's so much better and I think it'll continue to do it and I think the generations will find a way to do it. We'll have some ups and downs just like we have it now, but it'll... Uh, I think it'll do it. I think we'll see some real tough times coming up, but I think it'll all be worked out if they work at it hard enough. That was beautiful. What would you want to say to the men who were killed in the war? If you could talk to them, what would you want them to know? Well, I, I would think it want them to know that the people, the American people did appreciate and, and honored what they did and honored that they had to, they, their, lives, their lives were taken during this war. And uh, then I think that that would be the one thing that I would think about. And I would think to them and let them know that the people really did appreciate what they've done. Put, 
because that's our freedom and that's what we've got now. And what kind of person do you want people to always think of you as, Mr. Harper? As uh, what kind of man, I guess, would you want to, people to? I, I don't. I don't know. I've never thought about what people. I, you know, I just. I figure that you know either people like you or they don't like you, and uh, and I just would just hope that people would be you know think that well he was okay. You yeah. gotta give me a little more than that. I'm, I'm sure you're better than okay. Well, I mean, I, you know, if they did that, I think that would be fine. I don't, you know, I I don't look for any tremendous amount of praise or or something. I just don't. I don't need it. You know. A good father, a good husband, a World War II veteran. Is there anything in particular? For me, no, I, I don't, nothing, I, like I say, I, I just don't, don't want people to say, hey, you know, he was something different. I, I was just, it was me, and, and that's it. That was 